Day weekend. This is Pop Start Plus. I'm Joe Fryer filling in for Carson. On today's show, get ready to be transported to a European vacation. We're talking with two stars of the new movie, Love in the Villa. And yes, it takes place in Italy. After that, we're going to share our visit with one of our absolute favorites, Keenan Thompson. The SNL star is hosting the Emmys this year and updated us on his plans and his life. And later, a fun 90s look back with Hugh Grant. But first, he's Pop Start. Let's get to it. We're starting off with Luckiest Girl Alive. We have an exclusive first look at the trailer for the upcoming best-selling book-turned-movie. It's based on the novel by Jessica Knoll. Mila Kunis stars as a woman who seems to have it all until her past comes back to haunt her. Take a look. I'm working on a documentary about the incident at your high school. There are still so many questions that you've never answered. People want to know, were you a hero or... Imagine what it's going to be like when they find out about what happened. How could you not tell me about this? I carried this horrible thing with me alone for years, and it has built up this rage inside of me. Honey, get out! Don't touch me! I don't know what's me. I'm what part I invented. Mm. Oh, I want what I invented? Is that mm. what she said? That's oh. a dark one. I read that Ooh. book, and yes. I don't remember anything that happened, but <laughs> I remember it being good. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. Refresh your yes. memory. Wow. Um, you that can catch good. the full trailer on Today.com. Mila will also join us on September 28th to talk about her role in Luckiest Girl Alive. Premieres on Netflix on October 7th, so there's still time to read cool. the book yes. before the movie. <laughs> All right, next up, Julia Roberts and George Clooney. The iconic pair is gearing up for the release of the upcoming movie, Ticket to Paradise. They play a divorced couple teaming up to try and stop their daughter's wedding. Here's a peek. I think your things are in my seat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, come on. You've got to be kidding me. Excuse me, ma'am. I need to sit somewhere else. We used to be married. Worst 19 years of my life. We were only married for five. I'm counting the recovery. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking forward to that one. In real life, everyone knows Roberts and Clooney are longtime friends. The pair actually opened up to the New York Times about working together, joking that a single kiss between them took six months to shoot. It took 79 takes of us laughing, and then the one take of us kissing. Roberts joked. Ticket to Paradise hits theaters October 21st. That's going to be a good one. 80 yeah. takes. And can you imagine trying to do a kissing scene with one of your best friends? No. Like, that's just... And George Clooney is hysterical. Yes. yes. Right? I couldn't even imagine. All right, next up. Don't worry, darling. <laughs> darling, we're going to keep the movies going here. The psychological thriller, it premiered at the Venice Film Festival last night, bringing together the biggest stars of the film, Harry Styles, Florence Pugh, and Olivia Wilde. They all hit the red carpet alongside their co-stars to promote the upcoming movie. Now, as fans wait for the movie's release, we all know that... There have been rumors of a falling out between the lead, Florence Pugh, and director Olivia Wilde. Didn't well, Olivia addressed, addressed the rumors uh, at a press conference yesterday. Take a look. I can't say enough how honored I am to have her as our lead. She's amazing in the film. And as for all the endless tabloid gossip and all the noise out there, I mean, the internet feeds itself. I don't feel the need to contribute. I think it's sufficiently well-nourished. <laughs> that's true. And that's that. Well said. Okay. Yes. Don't worry, darling. Hits theaters on September 23rd. Okay. Okay, next up, the NFL. We've been talking about it all morning. It's a big week for football fans, and we've got a lot to get to. So let's kick off with an exclusive first look at a new video from the NFL showing how the league is gearing up for this season. Okay. Welcome to the 103rd. We're trying to call out other people. <laughs> yeah. Wait, was that Tiffany Haddish? Yeah. I saw Everyone Simone. In that one. Well, oh. you're, you're not wrong, because they're all in it. Oh, Simone's oh. in it. Oh. Lil Wayne's in it. Sweetie's in oh. it. Oh. Uh, they all teamed up for that legendary pep rally to celebrate the start of the season. If you want to watch the whole thing, wow, you yes, can, of we course, do. go to today.com for the uh, full video. I'm going immediately. I see that. It's fun. It gets you fired up. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. it's September oh, now. Yeah. We're ready for Let's football. Let's do it. Season. All right, and also making his return to the NFL, Tom Brady. We haven't talked about him in a few days. Uh, the star quarterback opened up about his decision to return to football on his Sirius XM show. Let's go. Take a look. I just felt like I had a little left, and I want to give it a shot. And I owed it to my teammates, and uh, 
our great coaches, and our whole organization. We built something pretty special here in Tampa the last few years. The competitive fire still burns, and I want to get out there and I want to have a great season for everybody because there's a lot of people that have supported me along the way. And if you want one more reason yes. to look forward to the NFL season, yeah. Ozzy Osbourne. What? The He's rock returning. legend is set to take the stage during halftime at this oh. Thursday's season kickoff between the LA Rams and the Buffalo Bills. It's actually his first U.S. appearance and performance since 2019. Okay. Of course, you can catch the kickoff game. It's this Thursday right here on NBC. Wait, a halftime musical show? Oh, I mean, the yeah. first game? Oh. There's more you need to know, starting with Andy Cohen. Everyone loves to show off their happy sun-kissed family photos after a good vacay. But our buddy Andy, well, he's keeping it real in a new video from inside the tough car ride home with his kids. Ben, you just watched Bob the Builder for six hours while I packed the car up. You can't want to watch more. We're going back to the city. You've been wanting to go back to the city. What? Okay, okay. Do you feel better now? Um, no. I, I still have a cow. Well, I was you what? I was just kidding. You were just kidding. <laughs> wow. Ah, uh, the many highs and lows of being three years old. Congrats to all the parents who survived this summer and cheers to going back to school. And finally, Leah Michelle, the multi-talented actress, is getting ready to take the stage as the lead in the Broadway show Funny Girl. Entertainment Weekly revealed these first look photos of Michelle as Fanny Bryce. As she prepares for her first show, Leah says she's over the moon and so nervous at the exact same time, describing the role as a dream come true. Leah Michelle's run in Funny Girl begins tonight at the August Wilson Theater here in New York. And that is the latest for you today. Coming up, the stars of Love in the Villa give us a glimpse into shooting in real life Verona, Italy. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. NBC News, streaming free now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. What would you do if you arrived for a European vacation and your Airbnb was double booked? Well, that's what happens in a new movie called Love in the Villa. And two of its stars spoke to the fourth hour's Donna Farazin about shooting in real life gorgeous Verona, Italy. This is the movie we all need right now. We need romance, we need Italy. I love that you two, you know, you actually shot the film in Italy. What was it like being in that romantic and historic setting? It's yeah. incredible. I think we both said, right, that it's the best filming experience we've ever had. I mean, it's just incredible. It was a dream. It was an absolute dream. There were so many locations, the people, the food. It was, it was magical. Who are you? Who am I? What are you doing here? I'm sorry, are you insane? You've just walked in here. Wait, jeez. Uh, no. No. <laughs> I rented this villa for the week. Look, I'll prove it to you. See? Julie Hutton, house and host. Nice to meet you. Charlie Fletcher. Vacay and stay. 
I mean, when I was watching it and the characters, you know, at first you didn't want to be together. I'm like, come on, these two gorgeous people. I would totally be like, sign me up to be overbooked with the, either of you two. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> would you, in real life, if you were overbooked in a villa, would you stay or would you go? I would put up a fight. I'd be like, you gotta go. <laughs> there with you after I just got dumped no I need space <laughs> I, I'd probably like invite I'd probably do what Charlie does later on and I'd be like listen let me cook you dinner we'll go out we'll have some drinks you know what actually what because it's based on a true story because this actually happened to Mark Stephen Johnson yeah oh I didn't know that it was based off like an event that where he went to Paris and met uh, a woman in a, in a in a villa that was an Airbnb but they didn't have a romance, but they yeah. became really good friends. They're still in touch now. Well, nothing beats the romantic aspect of it. Um, I think everyone dreams of this type of scenario for themselves. Would you say that you, Tom, are more of a Charlie then? I'm probably close to Charlie, um, sort of in the latter stages of the movie, yeah. I mean, I'm certainly not as rude as Charlie is early on. But uh, in terms of like my planning and things like that, yes, I'm, I'm quite sort of, let's go with the flow. Don't worry about it. We'll just, we'll just deal with it when we get there. Kat, are you well organized or more go with the flow? <laughs> what are you laughing at, Tom? Because I know, I know the well, answer. I'm answer the questions as you know. She is, Julie. <laughs> Well, you know what, Kat? Being Julie has gotten you very far in life. So congratulations. Compulsive successful is what I like to call it. Um, but I have since stopped planning as much and I've learned to go with the flow. I no longer laminate my itineraries and I don't use my journal every day. So I'm doing better and better and better, especially when it comes to my personal life. There's so many elements in this movie. There's heartbreak, there's falling in love, there's being independent. Do you have any lessons in heartbreak, in dealing with heartbreak or in dealing with not settling? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, Tom's saying I am this character. It's not just the character. It's I had a breakup. We got back together in Verona. This was years ago. My ex fiance's name is Brandon. Darren, my now fiance, is allergic to cats. There's there were things that were in that that the crew built in our actual villa. They had no idea it was the same thing I have in my house. There were weird things like that. Um, so, and I'm a spiritual person, so Me I think- Me too! I'm like, did you manifest this? What's happening? I think God uses my art as a way to get me to deal with myself or to teach me lessons, to deal with the things that scared me. If I could give anyone any advice, it's to just be open and stop trying to control everything and um, follow your heart. And it sounds really corny, but I've learned so much about allowing myself to just fall in love and, and be happy. Wow, Kat, I loved that so much. You know, it was so funny when I was watching the movie, I didn't realize at first, Tom, that your girlfriend was your wife in real life, Laura. Yeah. Sharing a screen and a set with her, I know that you've done this before, but in, in this romantic setting of Italy, like, what was that like? Oh my God, amazing. Um, just, the, I mean, it was the first time actually as well that we'd been away uh, together alone without our children for a bit. So to go away and do a movie together, doing the thing we both love was amazing. What are you most excited for people to see when they're watching Love and Vanilla? I think, well, I kind of feel that Verona is a hidden gem of Italy, actually, for most people. I think when people go to Italy, they think of Rome, they think of Milan, they think of Venice. And for me, Verona is the one. It's, I think I, I want people to watch it and go, oh my God, is that what that city looks like? How are more people not going there? It's still relatively quiet. So I also hope I don't destroy it by having more tourism there because it's kind of beautiful, it's not overcrowded. Um, but it's just uh, endless sights, like sight after sight after sight and view after view, it's just incredible.
Kat, if you could describe Love in the Villa in a sentence or two, how would you describe it? It's a movie about conquering yourself and believing in destino. We should mention you can catch Love in the Villa on Netflix. Up next, the hilarious Kenan Thompson's visit to Studio 1A. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for sticking with us here on Pop Start Plus. Kenan Thompson always brings a huge smile when he visits us here on Today. And during his latest visit, he talked about hosting the Emmys, SNL, and more. Keenan Thompson has been making us laugh for decades. Yeah, he first broke onto the scene. Guess how long ago? <laughs> Keenan, guess. 30, 30 years oh, ago, starring in classics like Nickelodeon's that All That and the baby. Mighty Duck movies. <laughs> the tiny, oh, and they're my favorite right there. Today, Keenan continues his reign as the longest running cast member in Saturday Night Live history. Next week, Keenan will take the stage as the host of the 74th Emmy Awards right here on NBC. Keenan. You know what Savannah and I have been singing? What's, what's up with that? that? Oh, yeah. Keenan, what's mm, up with mm, that? Mm, uh -huh, uh -huh. Can't the up. Emmys, what's, what's up with that? Mm, oh, my God. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Good morning. Well, good, good morning. morning. Good morning. So, what do you do? How do you get ready for the Emmys? Um, a lot of, like, phone calls back and forth to yeah. figure out, like, what it's going to be. But uh, a lot of joke writing. Like, the writers are, like, really writing a lot of jokes. And trying to figure out who wants to do bits and stuff like that, you know what, what I mean? What do you mean? Like other people are going to join you? Yeah, like the famous folks, you know what I'm Ooh, saying? Like uh -huh. who's, who's down to who? do something funny. Uh -huh. Whoever's in the room, you know, we've been reaching out to a lot of different people. Um, all my, like, SNL brothers and sisters that'll be in the building, I'm sure, are going to be down for, for, for whatever. Uh -huh. um, but... It'd be nice for, like, you know, the elders, like the Sudeikis of the world to, to do some <laughs> the stuff. The, the haters of the world, you yeah. know. Um, but also, um, you know, anybody. Like, like, I feel like, you know, we've been reaching out to people like Kamel and, like, maybe Lizzo and stuff I've been hearing. So these are all, like, you know, unconfirmed, but hopefully confirmed okay. kind of, like, things. Well, after you mentioned Lizzo, we heard that you were hoping to do, like, a big musical number. Yes. Mm -hmm. How, mm -hmm. is, do you think that's going to come together? It's coming together kind oh. of well. I mean, I think you kind of got to have some music in the name. You know, it's Grand State Academy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, you yeah know, uh, something so grandiose. A, a little hint about what that might be? How it um, might look? What can the hint be without yeah. giving it away? Um, I, it, it'll be an, um, kind of an e eclectic gathering of tunes. If that, okay. If that's okay. A, a hint. Hint, hint, <laughs> you do, by the way, do you get nervous before something like this? You do live, obviously, you do live television all the time at SNL. Yeah, I feel it. I mean, I try to turn that, you know, nervousness, you know, wordage into, like, adrenaline mm -hmm. or something like that or, you know, 
testosterone. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel I feel it now. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like just knowing that, you know, it's Tuesday now and Monday is approaching. And yeah. Blah, blah, blah. It's just like always on my mind. So I'm just like ready to get it done. Uh -huh. Wow, you're going to crush it. Uh -huh. Full you. faith. Thank and then you. You're, you have your, is it the 20th season, do we say, on SNL? Yeah, starting number 20. Oh, my oh, gosh. Yeah. Like, crazy, right? So, like, what? You're staying power there. Yeah. I think I saw you on the smart, or you were on the smart, smart list podcast, list. and you were like, yeah. "I'll stay forever." Yeah. yeah, yeah I'll I stay till you're 100. Will you? That's yeah. my mentality. You know, like it's just nice to be asked back. That that's been this ongoing thing. Like, who am I to deny them when they call? You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Like it's such an institution, but you know, it's it's my home. You know, and it's it's nice <laughs> to have stability in life. So <laughs> I just like you know keep. <laughs> you know, just stacking all these clips and, and looking back on it is the on. best. And these moments, I was just on Kevin Hart's podcast and we were talking about that sketch right there. Yeah. The Corner Boys. Uh-huh. And, you know, I'm just working with a lot of brilliant people like the Mulaney's of the world, you know? So, how do you, how do you know, like, how do you know how to do an Al Roker? Like, how do you even know how to do It's just what that? I, it's what I hear. Yeah. You know? So what do you <laughs> And like my, that? my kind of like, you know, if he was projecting, that's what I would be taking away yeah. from it. <laughs> but he's just so jolly. I was asking where where he is a minute ago. I was I like, know. where is Roker at? Can you, you know, he's just he's out of such a presence. Uh -uh. And he's just so, he's always smiling. So that just makes me <laughs> feel like he's just very giddy. And he wants everybody to know what's going on in their neck of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. By the way, there's a, people love to write in and say, this is why I wish would be the guest host this mm -hmm. year, some special guest host. Yeah. Carol Burnett's getting traction. Oh, that Carol would be Burnett. amazing. She's never She's done it. Tracking. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. What do you think of that? I feel like that's a crime. You yeah. Know? <laughs> know, you know, she's an, an incredibly brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, Carol Burnett actually presented me Miami when we won. That oh. was amazing. She was the, the uh, presenter of that category. And that was the first time I've ever even been close enough to even, like, Mm -hmm. Imagine touching Carol Burnett. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it was, it was an amazing Wait, moment. We gotta hit so one she's got to do it. Yeah. yeah, you just got your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I sure did. How cool is that? Wow. Gold star for the kid. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was an incredible moment. It really was. Like Meaningful? very touching. Whole family. Yeah. Leslie came out. JB came out. Look at the babies you kids. there. The it was, girls. It was the best. Yeah. It was. It was a great day. Yeah. It was, it was. It was. It was crazy to witness something like that and still feel so young, you know yeah. what I mean? It, it seems like such a end of the road kind of thing. I heard your neighbors but, with Lauren Michaels on the on the Walk of Fame. Right next, he was right next to That's me. cool. Like, that's so crazy. Like we had, you know, half of his name covered up because of the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> so slightly disrespectful. <laughs> but yeah, that it, it's, it's just wild to, to think about, you know? Oh. Gotta love Keenan, and we should mention you can watch him as your Emmys host coming up on Monday night at 8 o'clock, 7 central on NBC. Next up, we're traveling back to the 90s with Hugh Grant. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. NBC News, streaming free now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just weekend. feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. Any Notting Hill fans out there watching? The 1999 romantic comedy star Julia Roberts and Hugh Grant. And in honor of Grant's 62nd birthday this week, a little something from the vault. His visit to today, all about the film. Grant, good morning. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. So this teams you up once again with the screenwriter and producer 
from four weddings and a funeral. That's right, yeah. Was it nice? Was it a nice reunion, nice to be back with those people? Uh, well, it was. It was like getting back into a warm bath, you know, after uh, years in the wilderness of people, you know, giving me not such great uh, romantic comedies. And suddenly to have this great writing again was, uh, was fabulous. But um, having said that, it was very scary because suddenly it's a much bigger budget. I was going to say a and, much, uh, much, much bigger budget, well, right? right? And partly because we have this actress called Julia Roberts in it. Uh, which Who? Someone called Julia <laughs> Roberts. She's good. You watch out for her. She's, she's going to be big. And, um, you know, obviously everything suddenly becomes a different kind of ball game. So it's scary in that way. The uh, idea apparently came from screenwriter Richard Curtis's brain. He was uh, <laughs> staying up one night thinking about what it would be like to suddenly have these two worlds collide, the, the most famous person in the world, which seems really right for a movie because so society is so obsessed with celebrity right now. Yeah. Get together with somebody who really doesn't have a clue about popular culture, right? That's right, a non-entity and a rather sort of, um, as you say, naive non-entity. When you heard about this, this plot, I know that Julia said that she thought, I don't think this is such a hot idea. What did you think when you heard about it? Uh, no, I think that's a, a fascinating idea. I've always wondered, uh, you know, if that can really happen. A very ordinary kind of guy falling in love with a very, very famous woman or, or the other way around. And um, I think a lot of people are fascinated by the prospect of that. You know, would the spark or just the basic charm or whatever that chemistry is, can that vault over this great divide in, in, in terms of, you know, celebrity? And uh, I like to think it can. And Richard, who wrote the script, hates me telling this story. And in fact, I'll get into trouble for telling it again now on national television. But it, it did happen to a friend of his who was just an ordinary English guy shopping in Harrods, big department store in London. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so know I it. never know what people know. I mean, I know what you know. It. <laughs> yeah, but you're right. A lot of people know um, that. So. And who met an unbelievably famous person whose name I can't reveal. Oh, come and on. Ended up, <laughs> no, that's why it's a sort of boring story as well as a naughty one. Uh, and ended up having a, a fling with, with her. And that became the basis or the germ of this film, I think. What was it like working with Julia Roberts? Were you at all intimidated at the prospect, or did you all get on immediately? No, I think we were all terrified, um, especially me. I mean, I had met her many years ago and, uh, when she was going to do a film in London, and I was a sad, unemployed actor. And, um, I was one of many sad, unemployed <laughs> actors who she rejected, threw away like so much trash for this film. But uh, we got on very well at that thing. And, uh, I knew it would be all right in the end in this film, but I, it, didn't make me, it didn't stop me from being unbelievably nervous when she first showed up. I was talking to her about the other actors uh, in the film, too, and uh, how important they really are to the whole mood yeah. of the movie. Um, were, were these people, she didn't know any of them before this film because right. they're all British, but were these people you knew or had worked with at all? Or? Um, I hadn't worked with them, but I knew who they were because they're all big uh, TV stars in England or... Yeah, you know, well known in, in, in England and uh, as you say they're very important to the whole thing it's like Four Weddings and a Funeral was like a sort of ensemble piece up to a, up to a point and uh, Richard Curtis the author of the piece is very keen on friendship and on um, I don't know just on a whole sort of bedrock of, of good supporting characters and there's some hilarious performances the guy who plays my uh, flatmate, my roommate in this, is uh, particularly hilarious. He is very funny, isn't yeah, he? Yeah. Um, you know, some people have said, here's Hugh Grant, once again playing Hugh Grant. I mean, you've heard <laughs> this a million times, Hugh. And, mm. and, and it must be frustrating for you to, to read that or hear that. You know, well, once again, he's playing the affable, <laughs> bumbling, romantic, right. lovable, right. shy, self-deprecating person. Yeah. What do you think when you, when you hear that or read it? Well, you're right. It is vaguely frustrating. I mean, because to anyone who actually knows me, um, I'm not that person. I'm, I'm a lot nastier than that. Uh, <laughs> Plus, in, in fact, I mean, for years, I, I, all I did was villains um, for all the way through the 1980s. And in these kind of situations, these interviews, people would say, why do you always play villains? Why are you always the same thing? So I think people like to hang you on a hook as an actor. It just so happens Richard's written two parts, which are actually rather like him. He's the author. And I just sort of ape him. And those two happen to have been the most successful that I've done. And there you have it, today's Pop Start Plus. And as always, we'll have much more for you tomorrow. Until then, take care. Do you ever just look around and say, I can't believe we did this? Yes, totally. That was like, 
the light bulb moment. I got up there and I just said I quit my job and started this company. And I just kept going. It was a lot of testing and learning. There's been a lot of tears along the way. We can actually change the world. When did you have the moment? I made it. I did it. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of She Made It, my favorite, where we highlight some amazing women who are building incredible businesses from the ground up. This half hour is all about brands that help us celebrate, whether it's edible cake toppings for that big birthday coming up or a beauty industry mainstay that helps you feel your best. It's our She Made It Fall Fests and Favorites edition. We are going to meet women whose businesses empower us to make each moment a special one. Plus, I'll reveal my She Made It It list, featuring four entertaining but practical companies to help you bring in the season with flair. Let's get started. When Lisa Stelly was baking her daughter a birthday cake, she realized not all sprinkles are created equal. And from there, her edible empire was born. I hear a lot of entrepreneurs talking about imposter syndrome. So I think just kind of battling that inner voice that says, you can't do this. That's been something that I've had to kind of overcome. I think sometimes it always comes up, but yeah, the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding, but more specifically on the sprinkle. Let's rewind and tell me how this all began because it's kind of a roller coaster story for you. You know, I was making cakes that looked really cool and I didn't want to put cheap, crumbly grocery store sprinkles on it and like ruin what I made. Just through a bit of traveling and discovery, I realized that not all sprinkles are created equal. So with 2,000 of her own dollars, Lisa Stelly created a more flavorsome version of the childhood classic. Truth be told, I've never made a good batch of cookies in my life. I'm not a good baker, but I've always done like crafting and sort of different sort of like artsy type of hobbies that I would get into. But baking was not really one of them because I thought you had to be a good baker in order to be a good decorator, right? Wrong. Lisa is a big believer in sprucing up store-bought goodies to create her own beautiful edible pieces of art. You went from being, you know, couldn't make a cupcake to being the sprinkle queen. I know everyone's like, oh, you must just throw down for Thanksgiving and Christmas. I'm like, actually, I bought a pie. I love the story you tell about how you sort of branched into this. Your mm -hmm. daughter said to you, mommy, I want a certain kind of cake in the mm -hmm. middle of your funk. Yeah, she was like four and she said, I want a Shopkins cake. That was a hard cake. I used fondant, things that I had never really played with before, but I watched so many videos and then I was like, I think I can do this. And once I started to get the hang of it, I just was like obsessed. Like I remember staring at that cake thinking, I cannot believe I made this. That cake inspired a hobby that felt like destiny. When you're a mom and you're a stay-at-home mom, you kind of feel like everything is about everyone else. So in this, and it made me feel like so accomplished and productive that I could actually make something like that. Soon, Lisa was sourcing sprinkles from around the world to create unique and colorful blends. Okay, so I have some of your products here that you sent me. Tell us about the different categories you have. They almost look like jewelry. <laughs> so we have sprinkle blends, which are made up of different types of sprinkles that we put together and they all have names. Uh, that's Snow Bunny. That was a holiday one. I never liked sprinkles because I just felt like they were really mushy. They didn't have a flavor. They were just kind of gross. Mm. And then- It's like candy. I always say, fancy sprinkles will fix anything. People are like, I don't know how to decorate a cake. It looks like a kindergarten just made on it. Some and I literally am like, just put them on there and it makes anything look nice. Since starting her company in 2016, Lisa has expanded into Easy Candy, a line of melting candy wafers, and is revolutionizing edible glitter. We have a whole line of edible glitter called Prism Powder, it's probably right up your alley. You can put it in cocktails, you can put it in champagne, you can put it oh. on. It's very glittery. I mean, it looks so, like eyeshadow. It's tasteless, it's textureless, or you can put it on baked goods. It's so luxurious and glamorous and so fun. After starting in her own kitchen with small amounts of sprinkles, Lisa is astonished by how she made it. I have a 10,000 plus square foot warehouse with a food processing facility, dozens and dozens of employees all within five years. And every time I go to the warehouse, I'm still like in awe. I'm like, this, there's like a million pounds of sprinkles here. Like, how did this happen? I just want to eat this whole platter. Well, Fancy Sprinkle says, with 
In 24 hours after their segment aired on the Today Show, they had nearly 50,000 visitors to their website, resulting in their biggest sales day ever. Hooray! Since then, they have launched eight new seasonal collections and a new product category, food coloring gels, called Jelly Hues. Their fall collection just dropped, including their pumpkin spice blend, their hot harvest cocktail kit, a salted caramel apple kit, yum, and the salted caramel hot chocolate bomb kit. Perfect additions to any fall fest you might be throwing this season. All right, still to come, the eyebrow queen, Anastasia, shares her journey to becoming a self-made billionaire with a B. Plus, the founders making their own kind of tea party with their line of boozy teas. We'll be right back. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? Hey, Miss Lester. Hey, who's this? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just weekend. feel good to be back to it school? Does. Start today. who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? Hey, Ms. Lester, hey, who's this? Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Welcome back to our She Made It Fall Fests and Favorites edition. And speaking of one of my favorites, I'm excited to bring you the story of Julissa Prado. Inspired by her family and her Mexican heritage, she started mixing all natural ingredients in her kitchen to create products that enhanced her gorgeous curly hair. Today, Rizzo's Curls has gone global, helping women everywhere not only style, but embrace their curls. Take a look. Learning to love my hair was the first step towards learning to love myself. Julissa Prado has been consumed by hair her entire life. I was styling my cousin's hair, my friends, my family, and I would hold these little curl classes in, my, in the bathroom, in elevators, and when I was in college in the dorm rooms. But she struggled to find the right kind of products to take care of her curls. So Julissa made her own out of all natural ingredients like flaxseed and lemons. Tell me how the journey started. My grandmother and my mother and my parents, they grew up in very rural Mexico where if they wanted to have nice hair or a healthy scalp, they had to go outside, pick plants and utilize natural ingredients and make their own concoction. Armed with those concoctions, Julissa set out to help the women and men who came to her for guidance. People who she affectionately calls undercover curlies. It's people who have naturally wavy, curly or coily textures, but you would never know because they go through great lengths to straighten it and hide that natural texture. I'm an undercover curly. And here are the pictures to prove it. Girl, if I styled your hair, <laughs> After pursuing a career in business, Julissa realized her passion was in those holistic care products she had spent so much time perfecting. So she invested her life savings and launched Resos Curls in 2017. I literally had zero marketing dollars. Um, so what I did was the drawing of my bottle, my cousin Vanessa drew that by hand. My models on my website were my cousins and I, the photographer was my brother, the website I made. My headquarters was my Theo Juan's garage of a Washington Crenshaw where I grew up. All the fulfillers were my little cousins. And the hard work paid off. Eventually, Julissa's products were in Target locations across the country. What was that moment like? Hey everybody, we're going to Target. Woo! Sold out. 
Oh my God, just thinking about it makes me emotional. <laughs> um, so I think for me, it's just a testament of like all the hard work that went into like that one moment. And to this day, I'm still 100% self-funded. And now you're on She Made It on the Today Show. <laughs> With the launch of the Rizos Curl Cream, her business became the first Latina-owned curly hair care brand to be sold in major retailers across the United States. In the last five years, their product line has grown and now includes a collapsible travel diffuser, a scalp scrub, and hair mask. I love how you package this before and after um, with the product. What was the impetus and the idea for this kind of branding? Because I think it's genius. We wanted to make it as easy as possible. So we're like, all right, let's just put all like the wash day products on one side and the styling products on the other and try to just show the steps in the actual visual. Julissa's mission to make curly hair care accessible for people around the world. When you are, you know, doing exactly what you're put on this earth to do, you will start experiencing a lot of good luck. And I think that once we start seeing, you know, those, those little answers, um, that's, that's kind of like how you know, like I'm in the right place at the right time and this is exactly where I should be. So here we have some of the products and Rizzo's Curl's newest product is the Volumizing Hairspray. It was already named one of L.com's best hairsprays for an all day hold as well as being hailed as a top June beauty launch by The Cut. Congratulations. And one of the biggest celebrations in the fall is Hispanic Heritage Month, a time to honor the traditions, cultures, and contributions of the Latinx community. Julissa and Rizzo's Curls have lots planned, including a capsule collection with kids of immigrants, another Los Angeles brand paying tribute to the immigrant story. Next up, we all know and love the iconic beauty brand Anastasia Beverly Hills, but have you ever heard the story behind it? After coming to the U.S. with nothing, Anastasia built a billion dollar business, making her the definition of self-made success. It didn't start as, oh my God, I want to build this amazing business, the multi-billion dollar business. It was a desire that uh, I wanted women to, to look beautiful. Anastasia Soiree is an icon in the beauty industry. So I'm kind of fangirling right now because wow. when you first popped onto the scene, I tried to get an appointment with you and couldn't. Oh, I appreciate very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anastasia is also the definition of self-made success. So I grew up in Romania. I have to say, growing up in a communist regime, uh, the only amazing thing was the, the school system. I had some incredible teacher. In 1987, Anastasia immigrated to the U.S. and settled in Los Angeles. My husband suggested that I should go to beauty school because I didn't speak the language. And he said that most of the Eastern European in Los Angeles are facialists. <laughs> but I was able to get a job as an esthetician in a beautiful boutique salon. And one day I went to them and I said, look, I, I don't, I, I'm kind of surprised that nobody in Hollywood pays attention to eyebrows. After saving up $5,000, Anastasia opened her own salon in 1992. Everybody thought that I'm really crazy. You live here for a year and a half, you barely speak English, you don't know how to write a check, and you don't have a credit card. And my answer was, what do I have to lose? She built up her business by focusing on eyebrows. There are three zones that in a perfect world should be equal. I over tweeze my eyebrows too much. The, the zone number one was smaller. Zone number two was way too big, so makes my face longer. Word spread, and soon enough, Anastasia was shaping the brows of Hollywood's most photographed faces. Naomi Campbell, Stephanie Saver, Cindy Crawford, Michelle Pfeiffer, Faye Dunaway, and I started working with Jennifer Lopez. You went from having zero clients to having all these clients, Yes. And then you had to come to the point where you said, how do I make this mess? So everything started with Poppy Montgomery, a beautiful actress. She went in Canada for six months to do a movie. So I went to an art store, I got the plastic sheet and I, and I cut a stencil for, specifically for her. And I gave the client 
um, and her makeup artist to maintain the eyebrow shape perfectly. This idea became the basis for Anastasia Beverly Hills, a line of eyebrow products that went to market in 2000. Since then, the company has expanded, becoming a mainstay in the beauty business, receiving a $3 billion valuation in 2018, and earning Anastasia a spot on Forbes American Self-Made Women. What are you most proud of? I am so proud of building and having, taking every opportunity that this country gave me to build an incredible business and, and that, uh, that I still love and I will continue to work till the day I die. Isn't that an incredible story? And we have some of the products here. And this year, Anastasia is celebrating the brand's 25th anniversary. Wow. And even 25 years later, they're still racking up beauty awards. And in September, they are launching a new product, the Brow Genius Conditioning Brow Serum, a multi-benefit tool that noticeably improves hair texture, manageability, and encourages the appearance of fuller-looking brows. Well, up next, we'll hear about women who made their dreams a reality. From the Silicon Valley engineer turned jewelry designer who calls her pieces wearable sculptures to the founders behind an adorable and inclusive gift wrap company. We'll be right back. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Welcome back to our She Made It special, all about fall fests and favorites. You're about to meet the entrepreneurs behind four innovative and exciting companies that are making their mark on their industries, jewelry, food, and beverage, and more. First up, Trisha Akubo. Trisha always saw her two passions, engineering and design, as competing. But once she merged them together, a booming business was born. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. In college, I led a double life, studying engineering at Stanford during the day and enrolling in a fashion design program at night. After graduation, I worked in media and e-commerce in Silicon Valley. I loved the structure of engineering, but yearned for more creativity. Eventually, my passions fused with jewelry. In 2013, with no outside funding, Maison Miru was born. It's a whole system of jewelry that you can mix and match to create your own signature look. Now, my double life is just my life. I get to be a jewelry architect, designing wearable sculptures and building blocks. And I get to make you the artist who puts it all together. 
So awesome, right? And the day our original piece aired, they saw a 50% increase in site traffic and a boost in sales. And since then, they've launched nap earrings, which are best sellers because they're designed to be comfortable with a flat back on them so they don't poke you. We've all been there sleeping and you're like, oh. They also dropped what they call the system, the ultimate earring set. And they're currently working on the ring edition of the system launching this fall. Well, we are excited. Well, something I'm also excited about, from items you can wear to some that you can drink, I want to introduce you to two co-workers whose afternoon tea parties turns into so much more. I'm Jenny. And I'm Maria. And we're the founders of Owl's Brew. We were working together at a marketing firm when I became obsessed with the immune-boosting powers of tea. I even got certified as a tea sommelier. We started making the most delicious tea-infused cocktails for office happy hours and soon realized we were brewing up a business. So in 2013, we quit our jobs to bring Owl's Brew to market. With our line of cocktail mixers available in over 1,000 stores like Publix and Whole Foods. Last year, we launched our boozy teas with refreshing flavors like matcha chamomile and jasmine blueberry. Within one year, we've sold over a million cans. Owl's Brew is for those who want to drink wisely. Cheers to that. Love these. Well, Owl's Brew is a delicious addition to any celebration. They've won four SIP awards, including the Innovation Award for their product line. And last fall, they launched a spiced chai and cranberry, which sold out. And this past summer, they released two new flavors, black tea and pineapple, and green tea and peach. Their most exciting news, they closed their first big round of fundraising at $9 million. Well done, ladies. Next up, Phaedra Randolph is changing the game for alternative and sustainable eating. She had a personal reason to explore plant-based foods, but wound up creating her own product and company along the way. Take a look. This all started when I was a kid, suffering from chronic migraines and IBS. But in spite of this, I was a competitive athlete and recruited to top colleges. But I suffered in silence until it was just too much. I visited numerous doctors, tried a variety of medications and supplements, but nothing worked until I started eating clean plant-based foods. Within weeks, my body began to heal and I finally felt like myself. But there was just one small problem. I loved dairy and I missed it so much. However, I found that the dairy alternatives on the market were too expensive, unsustainable, made from nuts, and used so much water. And they were filled with questionable ingredients. So using my chemistry background, I invented and filed patents for dairy using seeds, which is unprecedented in the industry. And then I decided to leave my job as an engineer at Facebook to launch Spiro. Today, Spiro is in hundreds of stores, including Whole Foods and Sprouts. We've launched sunflower cream cheese, cheese spreads, and are releasing new products soon. My mission is to democratize dairy alternatives so that every single person can afford to eat healthfully and sustainably. Spiro is set to launch their newest product, a plant-based keto-friendly pepita egg. It only has seven ingredients and it's free of soy, gluten, egg, dairy, nut, sugar, and processed oils. And that is coming out very soon. We'll keep you updated, so stay tuned. Okay, on to another business with a mission. I needed to put this on your radar before the holidays because packaging is so important. Our next story is bringing representation and diversity to gift wrap and other seasonal products. Meet the founders of Black Paper Party. I'm Jasmine Hudson. I'm Jaren Merchant. And I'm Madia Willis. And we're the founders of Black Paper Party. I met Jasmine and Jay after I moved to Arkansas to work in product development for a major retailer. Jasmine and Jay were running community-focused blogs, so they plugged me into my new life right away. We knew that we each had a unique skill set, but the same goal, to provide authentic representation of Black families and to spread joy during the holidays. So through intense brainstorming sessions, we started Black Paper Party. We launched the brand in September of 2020 when America was still reeling from the murder of George Floyd, and there was an increased focus on equity in the country. With everything going on in the world, we wanted to provide gifting solutions that would help people focus on what matters most, spending time and making memories with loved ones. Black Paper Party offers thoughtfully designed, trend-relevant wrapping paper, gift bags, and ornaments. 
And when you see our designs, you know it's gonna be a party. Look at these adorable items. Well, this past year, Black Paper Party won first place and $100,000 at the Macy's Workshop Cohort Pitch Competition and $10,000 from the Amazon Black Business Accelerator Awards. Woo-hoo! They've also expanded into kitchen goods. Looking ahead to 2023, Black Paper Party is going beyond winter holidays to Valentine's Day, Easter, and birthdays, becoming a year-round business. Bravo. Well, there's still more to come. Up next, it's my She Made It It list. Women own small businesses that are sure to keep the party going. We'll be right back. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back. I have even more extraordinary female-founded brands that I'm so excited to share with you on my She Made It It list. Here are some small businesses that will help you kick off autumn in the most fabulous way. Just leaf it to me. All right. Sisters Rumples Miranda and Kat Pasagan were born and raised in Manila, but moved to New York City to pursue their careers and start their families. They hope to stay connected to their Filipino heritage. So in 2016, they started their company, Kubo. Kubo partners with Filipino artisans to create handcrafted objects for the home. Kubo is a love letter to Filipino homemaking and a special brand for anyone who likes to host, entertain, and spend time with their loved ones. All right, next up, founder Mahogany Ellis Crutchfield says that with a little bit of sugar, spice, and everything nice, this millennial girl created a company specializing in all things joy. Gifty Wrap creates stationery and wrapping paper that reflects the diverse community we all live in. From designs celebrating holidays like Lunar New Year and Black History Month, to hobbies like Camping and astrology, Gifty Wrap has something for everyone. These are great. All right, our next company, Neat Method, you know, I love this, launched in 2010 to transform the organization industry. Co founders Ashley Murphy, a former Pilates instructor, and Marissa Hagmeyer, who worked in marketing and graphic design, came from two very different backgrounds, something they shared their love for organization. What started as a side hustle has grown into a major business and much loved product collection to help others live neat. Customer favorites also include items like drawer organizers, hangers, baskets, and bins. You know I'm a fan of this. And last up, Sipping This was born out of a deep love for wine and an even deeper desire to make people laugh. Founder Laura Leatherberry found it hard to find wine gifts that weren't cheesy or dated, so she created her own. She started with coasters, added apparel, and is excited to keep creating. My favorite saying, it takes a vineyard. <laughs> well, that is all for I She Made It today. Thanks for watching. And remember to shop these small businesses. Scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen or head to today.com slash shop. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jill Martin. And of course, I'll see you next time.
with this them. This is crazy. Yeah. This is like, it's like a, the best floral arrangement I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. I love mushrooms. I mean, I really, really love mushrooms. They are an essential part of a plant-based lifestyle because they're such an easy swap for me. But I've got lots of questions about fungi. How do they grow? Where do they grow? And which types have the most unique texture? I'm gonna learn all about their culinary range with chef and mushroom enthusiast, my friend, Sophia Rowe. Then I'll travel to Colorado to see how mushroom roots are being transformed into a hearty new protein. But first, I wanna learn some basics. So, I'm heading out to Smallholds, an innovative farm in Brooklyn, New York. Let's go. When you think about mushrooms, you probably think of those capped little fungi. But there are literally thousands of edible mushrooms out there. And no, I'm not talking about that kind of mushroom. A lot of people think that they don't like mushrooms because they're used to eating the same mushroom and they think all mushrooms are the same, but they're not. It's like saying you don't like mushrooms is like saying you don't like plants. Um, like, a, like the differences between a trumpet and an oyster and a button mushroom, it's like saying like an almond tree versus a head of lettuce um, and an apple. You know, they're very different. <laughs> Andrew Carter and Adam DiMartino founded Smallhold, an organic mushroom farm in 2017. They share a passion for rare mushroom varieties and want to bring those tastes and textures to more people. There's a whole kingdom out there and everyone's used to eating the same mushroom. A white and a brown mushroom and a portobello mushroom, they're all the same mushroom. That's right, white button, cremini, and portobello are all the same type of mushroom. Their scientific name is agaricus, if you want to be fancy about it. The industry grows those because that's what they're used to growing. Consumers are used to consuming those. You can look at other regions like if you go to China or Japan or Korea, the mushroom industry is way more advanced than it is here. It's so like consumers in certain regions are eating 10 to 20 times as much mushrooms as people are in the United States. So what were your first steps to starting Smallhold? The early beginning was uh, building out a lab in a basement at a house and it looked crazy. Andrew and Adam started experimenting with trumpet mushrooms. After perfecting the process, they expanded to shiitake and oyster. In just five years, that basement startup moved into a shipping container, then to their first farm in Brooklyn. The company has grown rapidly with funds from dozens of investors and a soaring demand for mushrooms. Over the last few years is that people really started getting interested in food as medicine, trying to eat less meat, trying to be sustainable, trying to eat local. All of these things ended up just kind of centering around mushrooms. In 2020, organic mushroom sales grew by 20%. Feeding that demand, Smallhold now grows 15 different types of mushrooms, producing a whopping 1.5 million pounds each year for hundreds of grocery stores and restaurants. Mushrooms are grown by a process called inoculation. A spore is placed deep inside a substrate, like a log. The spores germinate, then feed on the wood, growing into mycelium, or mushroom roots. This fruiting body is probably like four, four days, four or five days old. It takes about four weeks for the roots to be fully grown. That's when cute baby mushrooms called pins start to appear on the surface. In about a week, they're ready to harvest. Fungi are its own kingdom. They're functionally more similar to animals than they are like plants. They breathe in oxygen, they release CO2, they digest stuff, they don't go through photosynthesis and so their interaction with the environment is just so different than plants. Traditional mushroom farms cultivate their fungi in mulch with a mix of hay, straw, and corn cob. But Smallhold is focused on growing in urban areas to make the entire operation more sustainable. City farms might seem strange, but fungi don't require a lot of light, water, or space to thrive. Our mushrooms, we grow, they're called saprotrophic mushrooms, and so they're wood-loving mushrooms. They digest wood. All of the substrates that we're using, that's the stuff that's inside of this block. About 90% of it is sawdust. 
Small holds mushrooms are grown in bags filled with a compound from mills and factories, so they're reusing a byproduct from the timber industry. And those futuristic containers don't just look cool. And so these chambers themselves have really intricate controls over all the climate that they're exposed to. That allows them to forego pesticides. Plus, the fragile mushrooms aren't susceptible to extreme weather. Can you walk me through the environmental impact of growing mushrooms? It's one of the most sustainable products you can probably find in the grocery store. We did a big life cycle analysis, which is large like third-party analysis to understand exactly what's going on with your company. Our carbon impact was about 30% less than any other mushroom farm we could find. Over 60% of the country's mushrooms are grown in one Pennsylvania county, which means it takes a lot of fuel to ship them across the country. So a lot of mushrooms are actually imported from overseas, and so the carbon footprint of those is really crazy. Smallholds mushrooms are grown in Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and Austin, Texas. They also operate over a dozen mini farms, custom-built tanks that can grow mushrooms inside restaurants and grocery stores. With farms in strategically placed cities, Smallhold plans to reduce carbon emissions by continuing to ship locally. When you're buying a product from Smallhold, like a fresh mushroom in a grocery store, it was grown close to there. And so we have a national brand, like you can be from New York and go to LA and recognize Smallhold on the shelf, but those mushrooms were grown in LA. Most mushrooms also have a naturally meaty texture, which makes them a great vegetarian swap. The more people eat these products, generally speaking, they're eating less meat, whether they realize it or not. And so every time we get someone to eat a little less beef or a little less chicken, then we think that we have a larger impact on the planet because it's less carbon intensive, less water intensive. Okay, Andrew, we're gonna harvest these mushrooms, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, we have uh, blue oysters, we have lion's mane, yellow oysters, and trumpet mushrooms. Um, but we can start with the blue oyster. Let's do this it. This one's pretty fun because, you know, you can't make any promises, but a lot of the time, you kind of get the whole thing just in one pick. Whoa! Like that. Here you go. Ah. And so, big, <laughs> big blue oyster. Wait, mushroom. this is so dense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You uh, take a big cluster of mushrooms uh -huh. and you shove like garlic in here, like whatever herbs you want, so thyme and rosemary, but you just kind of like shove it inside the cluster itself. Do you roast the whole thing? I just roast the whole thing. So let's try the lion's mane. So I would just pick off. Pick off one of those. Yeah, there you go. Lion's mane is so beautiful and so unique. And this to me is like the most otherworldly mushroom because it just looks like no other. And when you uh, you can take it apart, it like kind of peels sort of like mozzarella. It's so or, like, crazy. A lot of people use it as like a shellfish replacement. Um, which Cause is you can pull it like so yeah, it's almost stringy. Next, we harvested yellow oyster mushrooms, which were more delicate than their blue cousins. They'd be perfect in a creamy soup. But even Andrew has a favorite fungi. I love trumpets so much, and so if you cut it, uh, this isn't the best knife skills, but you can cut them like this, and then you can have a nice scallop. Yeah. Now, these are probably the most popular for people who are trying to like imitate meat with a whole mushroom. And so the other mushrooms can give you the texture and the flavor, and nutrition and all that kind of stuff, but these can like really stand in as a fake scallop or a fake bacon. Why do you want people to eat more mushrooms? I mean, they're, they're great for you. There's a lot of nutrition. They're high in fiber, they have amazing antioxidants, they have vitamin D. And what I really like about them is that they have that umami and that experience that replaces meat. I already eat a lot of mushrooms, but I'm convinced now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. News is happening now.
to look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Smallhold got me excited to try something with my new favorite fungi. So I invited mushroom enthusiast, James Beard award-winning chef, my friend Sophia Rowe to my kitchen. Hi! My friend, Sophia, I told you this before, that we are talking about mushrooms. And I was like, listen, I can't do this without Sophia. Talk to me about the role that mushrooms play in your work and in your world. I went to culinary school and I was sort of kind of playing in that plant-based world and I felt like fungi and mushrooms were a really great way to encourage a lot of depth, which I feel like in plant-based cooking, sometimes you kind of lose, you know? you Like meat and dairy, those things create a lot of depth. It's pretty remarkable the types of flavors that you can create. And this is not a new idea. They're, particularly in Asian cultures, they've been using different kinds of fungus for forever um, in their cooking. But for me, that was really when I was like, okay, this is sexy. Can you just talk to me about how you work with them? It's almost about like, what am I trying to create? You know, if someone's a very big meat person and they want to go plant-based for a minute or for a meal, I think it's really important to cook things in the same way that you cook meat, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I don't even know that that's just mushrooms or just fungi, right? A lot of times with steaks, you're braising, you're roasting, you're searing. There's no reason you can't treat plants the same way. I'm, I'm just super excited to know what we're cooking today. Yes. Tell me about the dish and yes. uh, put me to work. All right, so what we have here is lion's mane. When I'm looking for a, a lion's mane, you want them to be kind of fluffy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been touching this one a lot. You don't want them to be slimy. You don't want them to stink. If they stink or they're slimy, they're no good. And that's kind of the rule, the general rule with any mushroom. Yeah. In terms of washing them, these are commercially cultivated. Mm -hmm. So they are not wild, these are not feral. So these are not gonna need to be like really, really washed. You just wanna, you wanna wipe them down, they're good. Do not get your mushrooms wet. You don't <laughs> like it. So this is a good one. This is a great shape. So what okay. we're gonna do is we're basically gonna make like a lion's mushroom steak. And you'll see that I've kind of like, as I'm even talking, I'm kind of pressing this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like where, just for a second, we're kind of like trying to create like a little steak here, mm. like a little hanger steak. Why okay? are you using lion's mane here, Sophia? I think lion's mane is really delicious, mm. but it's great structure. So it's really great in terms of like replacing meat. If you can't find this, you can cook an oyster mushroom or even a big portobello in exactly the same method. Mm. So the, the key here is you're leaving it nice and whole. Okay. I kind of want to press these down. So I'm just going to score this one side. Okay. And why are you scoring it? So we want the flavor to get in, mm. doggy. We want it to be inside. <laughs> right, so we're gonna make this glaze. All right, let's so do it. Because we're attempting to make a steak, okay? <laughs> what we wanna do is we wanna help, we wanna help these lines made mushrooms along. Three tablespoons of vegan butter. If you wanna use regular butter, that, that's, that's your you house do and that. do whatever you want. All right, we like, we like it softened like this because we're gonna be whisking it up. We want this to be like glazed texture. Okay. Okay. We also have coconut aminos. It's just like a soy-free, soy sauce vibe. <laughs> okay, I also like it because it's a little sweet. Yes, it um, is. And for a glaze, that's really nice. So the sweetness is important because the sweetness is gonna give us caramelization. So grab the sesame. Yes. Get it? Love sesame it. oil. Love it. We love it. You could use toasted if you wanted, but this is just regular old sesame oil. Next up, ingredients to really up the umami factor. Miso, Dijon mustard, and tomato paste. We're gonna just get, some, get a good, like, salt in there right. and then you're just gonna whiskey do dude so this is gonna get I think we have this on medium heat okay okay we have some grapeseed oil here the reason we're using grapeseed is high smoking point we're using cast iron you don't have to use cast iron you can use whatever you have um, so we're going um, score side down. down so what's gonna happen we're yeah gonna put them on we're gonna get a good sear on each side and then we're gonna brush our glaze on okay okay two minutes flip it two minutes then we're gonna take them off and we're gonna let them rest. Just like you would have Just steak. like meat. Just like meat. Crazy. We're gonna treat these just like meat. I love that. This is why we want this hot. 
Love it. Just drop it down. <laughs> what we can do here, this is like a little like a little tip too. You can mm. always just like just like, flatten it down. Yeah, same, same, like same you would we do. For I'm sorry, do you have a sound club? <laughs> <laughs> I do now. So just, just, just to kind of encourage again, you want to yep. encourage that flattening, right? Yep. Get it nice and thin, oh, and that way that. The, 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 the marinade is not having to penetrate so deep. You know how to make a steak, you know how to do these mushrooms. After three minutes, time for a flip. Look Wait. Look it, look it. Oh. Gorgina. So we're just going to brush this on, <laughs> almost like you're basting a steak or something. Oh, come on, baby. Everything about this feels like you are Van Gogh and I am your apprentice. Oh my God, you, but except you could do this, but you see I the sizzle and the, you know? So what's gonna happen is these are gonna be sitting here, they're gonna be caramelizing, they're gonna be getting juicy. We're gonna take the rest of this glaze and we're gonna baste them a little bit. Ooh. So this is, this. the basting method is never gonna be bad. It's always gonna be good. I mean, look how gorgeous that looks. It's beautiful. It's, I mean, stunning. A few more minutes in the pan. Literally crazy. Uh, crazy, right? It kind of looks like me, too. Uh huh. These are gonna rest, okay? Okay. It's five minutes. He doesn't need to okay. not Nothing trying crazy. to crazy. Like, nothing wild. As the mushrooms rested, Sophia chopped up some green onions for later. Then it was time to cut into the lion's main steaks. It's meaty. Can we dog. show them? <laughs> like, they need to know. That looks Everyone really alert. meaty. <laughs> alert. <laughs> but even like, it almost, it's almost like, like you wouldn't really know. It kind of, it just looks like. Mm -hmm. Chicken. Sophia recommends serving the steaks over rice with a few garnishes. First, some sesame seeds, then chili crisp, then scallions. Just like me, Sophia loves a little spice. Come on. Mm. It's so good. Wait, this is mm. this is literally the best mushroom dish I've literally ever had. Mm, it's so good. I love it. It is an unfamiliar ingredient mm. cooked in a familiar format. Correct. So I think if you're a beginner to mushrooms, mm. a really great thing to do is whatever you can find locally, just try cooking those mushrooms, whatever they are, mm. in this format. Mm. Try cooking them this way. Yeah. And you're gonna get a completely new relationship to mushrooms. Also, for the people who are like, I hate mushrooms, just Give the method a try, mm -hmm. right? I feel like we have to take a photo. Let's do it. Because like, when have we ever done a little friend cooking sesh? Let's do it. We need to do it. We need a whole photo shoot. We need a, we need a, we need a whole photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, wait, give me a hug. Thank you for coming. Of course. <laughs> Sophia's lion's main steak looked a lot like chicken, but one company in Colorado is completely transforming mushroom roots into an actual meat substitute. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now.
Meat substitutes are everywhere these days, and they're made with a wide variety of ingredients, from whole veggies to soy protein and different oils. Enter Meaty. Here in Boulder, Colorado, mushrooms are the main attraction, and I got an exclusive first look inside their new factory. Meaty isn't trying to replicate ground beef. They're mimicking whole cuts of meat, like steak or chicken breast. It's like a super meat. Yeah, it's a where, super meat. <laughs> where it has all the protein you would yeah. want from meat, but then all the fiber and vitamins and minerals you find in plants. Yeah. CEO Tyler Huggins founded Meaty in 2016 after earning his PhD in environmental engineering. Tell me your journey to Meaty and why you started this company. Well, let's we'll start off with, with meat. We, uh, we have a growing population, have a high demand for protein, Meat is, is a growing demand. Given my history uh, studying nature, I knew there was this really cool, magical, root-like structure in the soil. Biologists call it mycelium, we call it mushroom root. Tyler and his team developed a patent-pending process that turned the fuzzy, hair-like mycelium strands into a product that mimics the taste and texture of meat. Unlike mushrooms, you won't find the raw roots in any grocery store. Currently, Meaty sells a steak-like filet and a faux chicken cutlet that's available plain or with a crispy breading. And this is the place where it all comes together. This is it. This is where the magic happens right here. This is the future of food. The mushroom roots are grown inside these giant tanks. This is this, where Meaty is grown, We right? essentially take one spore. Yep. It's like the fungi equivalent of a seed. Okay. We start growing up the mushroom root, and then we throw it into this, into this tank. The tank is filled with water that's packed with nutrients mushroom roots need to thrive. And how long does it take to cultivate and grow and harvest meat? Extremely fast. In this facility, we're able to create the meat equivalent of a whole cow in just four days. So tell me how you replicate the texture of traditional meat. It all starts from the magic of this mushroom root. We grow it in-house in a clean uh, environment, so no exposure to heavy metals or pesticides wow. or herbicides or anything like that. At that state, it kind of looks like uh, applesauce. This is meaty in the raw form before it's processed. And when you form it into a, uh, a chicken breast-like shape or a steak, mm -hmm. those strands become the texture that is very similar. Again, eats just like traditional meat. You can eat it just like that. That's just all natural mushroom root. I'm gonna Go. eat it. <laughs> okay. It's a blank it's, canvas. It really tastes like, I don't want to say nothing because yeah. there is like a little bit of something, but it is so, like you could throw flavor and spice on that. Including mushroom root, Meaty's Chicken Swap has just four ingredients, salt, natural flavoring, and acacia gum, a fiber used as a food stabilizer. But I had to know, is it healthy? So one of our, our four ounce uh, steak has about 18 grams of protein. And then it has all the fiber and other vitamins and minerals you only find in plants. No cholesterol, no saturated fat, there's no sugar in it. Meaty is now available online, but it often sells out fast. Really fast. The company is opening a second farm to meet demand, and Meaty will soon be available on supermarket shelves. What is the future of Meaty? We see there's a lot of interest in alternatives to traditional meat. But what we're doing differently is whole food protein, simple ingredient lists, super nutritious, and whole cuts. I think that opens up an entirely new demographic and group of folks who, who are excited to embrace something like this. After hearing so much about these mushroom roots, I wanted to see how it really tasted. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now.
For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. In Boulder, Colorado, the folks behind Meaty are turning mushroom roots into a new meat substitute. At the factory's test kitchen, they're experimenting with the best ways to cook it. I met with Debbie Downing, the company's head research chef, to learn more. I'm so excited to try this. Will you show me how to cook it up? It's the mushroom root, right? Right, right. When you think about cooking mushrooms, it likes to soak up that oil, soak up the sauce. Super porous, yeah. Soak up anything that you give it. So best practices for our product is that we actually want to add oil to it first. Right. We want to just give a little bit of a drizzle here. Season with salt and pepper, a little oil in the pan, then time for the cutlet. All right, it's ready. Oh yeah. Sizzles really nicely. The chicken and steak both take about eight minutes to cook. Just like meat, the goal is to develop a nice sear for more flavor. I think it's ready All to right, flip. ready? Yeah. Woo! I just gasped. I haven't eaten chicken in a while. Yeah. I used to, so I know what chicken tastes like. Yeah. But I haven't cooked it in forever. And first of all, this is like very similar in cook. Like when you look at the browning yeah. and the caramelization around the edges. Like, did you want to cut it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like kind of freaking out right now. Get into it. I know, I know. Sorry, Tyler. I'm just like, just I'm processing. I can't get over how much it smells like chicken. And even looking at the texture, I'm going to pick it up and just show you. Oh my god, I just touched it for the first time, too. It's like the the texture of it, of animal protein that you would normally see, I feel like it has that. But how? It's the mushroom root, right? The fibers. That's the mycelium. Yeah, gives you that texture and that look. This is not chicken, but it really looks like it. OK, I'm going to taste it. Should I taste it? This is your first time, I'm like yes. stressed. Yes. OK. <laughs> is there a mic I can draw? This is like taking me back to when I used to eat chicken. Literally. And I'm not just saying this as I'm on camera. Next up, the steak filet. All right, steak. I'm trying it. You need another mic to drop? I need another it. mic to drop. This is insane. Yeah. This tastes like red meat. I haven't had chicken nuggets in years, so I was really excited to try the crispy chicken. This kind of takes me back to days of like growing up and eating fried chicken. chicken this is, am I getting punked? <laughs> <laughs> Got you. But I wasn't done eating yet. The meaty team had a big surprise for me. Shut up! I'm leaving. <laughs> I see my book. Yep. This is from my book. I didn't know I was going to eat chicken and cry today. My masala mac and cheese and cabbage salad from my cookbook both got the meaty treatment with their chicken. I was so excited. Also on the menu, breakfast tacos and steak in a chimichurri sauce. I even got to try some products in development, a turkey deli meat and beef jerky. They were delicious. This is not going to be cute. I'm just warning everyone now. <laughs> it is a pretty big sandwich. Mm. I'm taking this home. This. Wow. You guys are all like crazy magicians. Like something weird is going on here. <laughs> Whoa. That's breakfast. Yeah. In true meat fashion, we need to take a selfie. So yes. if you don't mind, yeah. we're gonna get in here. All right, say meaty. Meaty. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys so much. Yeah. This was so yeah. special. No, oh, thank you. I don't know if I can go on. My love for mushrooms has been cemented. From a delicious side dish to a show-stopping main, their culinary versatility is unparalleled. And that's what makes mushrooms truly magic.
Well, it is that time again when we trade the swimsuits and long summer nights for, for textbooks and early wake ups to make the school bus. Back to school is here. So we're dedicating the next 30 minutes to help you successfully navigate the return to school for, for college, high school, middle school, and where we will begin, kindergarten. Full transparency, this is also uh, quite the personal episode because my daughter's an upcoming kindergartner, so we're sort of navigating all of this at home right now. Founders of the wildly popular advice platform, Big Little Feelings, Kristen Gallant and Dina Margolin, they're here with me. They're gonna answer all of our questions. First though, what are these five-year-olds, what are they feeling about school? Well, we sat down with a few upcoming kindergartners in Seattle at Seed Early Childhood Center to find out. Take a look. Yep, you can just sit down right in that chair. My name is William. My name is Ben. My name is Layla. Jameson. So Hall. Ben is well, and I'm gonna start. Uh, I can't remember. Kindergarten. 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 I'm starting kindergarten this fall. for bigger kids. I don't know what it's like, but I really hope it's gonna be the best time ever. It will be like much different. I'm excited to ride the bus to school. I think I'm going to see like awesome stuff. I forgot what I was gonna say and I don't remember anyways. That's okay, that's okay, don't worry. I feel excited to be starting kindergarten. I think I'll learn how to help other people. I'm gonna learn how to read and to write. Math. I do like snakes. Art and acting. People pop. I am a robot. <laughs> I know all the ABCs. Really? Huh? That's awesome. Can you tell? QRS TV. And W, X, and Y, and Z. Even though I know a lot of rules about baseball, there's some rules and some stuff that I don't know about it. I think I mostly just want to read about dragons and unicorns because they're my favorite. Of playing alone. No, I'm not scared of anything. Well, I, I'm kind of scared that they're asking me to read by myself. It's going to be pretty weird. Not to be shy, I'm going to make friends. It won't be exactly the same as preschool, but it's for kids my age. That they want me to read. Read really good. So I can play all the video games. Can I just be done? Yeah, we can be done. All right. Nice work. If anyone watches that, they'll be amazed. <laughs> All right. Very cute kids there. Very cute. But uh, also some nerves in this big transition. Child therapist Dita Margolin and parenting coach Kristen Gallant, they started this Instagram account called Big Little Feelings to provide parents with helpful advice for their little ones and that little Instagram account now has about 2.6 million followers online, so we decided to invite them here. Kristen, let me start with you. Does it matter if your kindergartner can't count or can't say their ABCs yet? How much of a concern should that be? Right, and I can speak from experience. My oldest is going into kindergarten, and part of the back of my brain is like, is she reading on time? Is she doing it? Right. The answer is no. It does not matter if yeah. your child can read or do the ABCs or if they're a little bit behind their cousin or whatnot. The skill for readiness that we really want to teach for kindergarten or in advance if possible is independence. And what that means is things you would never normally think about. Can they open their lunchbox? Can they say, hey, I want the juice. I need to go to the bathroom. So independence, that's what we really want to focus on before. Separation anxiety. Yeah. That is something that a lot of parents and, and children struggle with, especially yeah. on the first day or in those first few days of kindergarten. 
What, what do we do about separation anxiety? New things are scary. And when we're scared, there's more emotions and more meltdowns, more crying, more clinging. So the one thing we want to do here again is prep. Help them understand what's going to happen so they feel more comfortable and more safe, which means more calm. So for drop off, for example, we're going to walk them through what they can expect. I'm going to drive you in the car. We're going to get to the school. Your teacher is going to open the door and help you out. I'm going to give you one hug and say, I love you. Bye bye. And then we have to really follow through with it because if we waver, if we linger, it sends a message to their brain saying, wait a minute, she said I was safe, but now she looks panicked. Uh, What's happening? Panic, right? Uh, so if we're confident again, we follow through, they'll feel safer. When they do start kindergarten, what, what should parents expect in terms of changes in emotions, changes in feelings, maybe even changes in, in, in behavior? Yeah, we can definitely expect, especially after school, more meltdowns. And they don't have the capacity to be like, hey, it was a really long, hard day. Like, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. Right? We're just going to see more crying. We're going to see them being aggressive with the baby. Right. They might be upset over ridiculous things like a crayon breaking. It's actually a compliment, and we like to think of it this way as an adult. When I've had a long, hard day, yeah. and my boss is riding me, yeah. and the gas station broke, whatever it may be, yeah. when I come home, I don't calmly turn to my husband and be like, honey, it's been a hard day. I lash out at him. That's I'm true. sorry, honey. You I, know, it's just like kids. So we're just supporting point, them, right? Because they've been bottling it up all day. If you're their safe person, they're going to yeah. take it out on you or with you yeah. because they feel safe now. Thank you. Thank you, Dina and Kristen. Thank you so much. Uh, when we come back, Chanel is going to take us to middle school. And then later we'll go to college. Al's going to get some answers, answers for his own life on how to be an empty nester. Stay with us. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. We've got each other now. Doesn't it weekend. just feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready. SG, you ready? We're fresh and reorganized for fall. Start today. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. I'm Chanel Jones. Our conversation continues with the adjustment to middle school. The kids are now switching classes, their hormones are raging, and social media is on the rise. One of New York City's largest after school and summer programs, New York Edge, strives to make this transition easier. The program helps sixth graders improve academically and support them socially as they adjust to middle school. Take a look. Don't be a fool. Take sixth grade and seriously. Pay attention. Don't pressure yourself. No matter how easy it is or how hard it is, always try your best. Words of wisdom for the incoming class of new middle schoolers from rising seventh graders. Lessons learned from experience. Sixth grade, it was fun and complicated. The fun part was the fact that I got to see most of my friends after quarantine. And it was kind of hard because of the schoolwork. Last year, Corey Tolliver began middle school after nearly two years of remote learning. I thought like it was going to be easy, but then once I got to sixth grade, I had found out that it wasn't that easy and I had to focus more. To help with the transition, Corey took part in New York Edge, a free after school and summer program that serves thousands of students. Its curriculum centers around what's being taught at school and helps kids like Corey and his classmate Aiden Lawrence succeed academically. Working in elementary school was easier. The work in sixth grade was kind of hard, but I understand it now. 
And for Caleb Tikasing and Jada Chance, the impact of the program staffers goes beyond schoolwork. Something that was really helpful was my counselors because they were always boosting me. Caleb, how's it going for you? Good? Even though some of us don't listen, I think that they have came a long way with us. Everyone here signed in? All right, perfect. We'll get started soon. The program also offers students access to a wide variety of enriching activities. That's money right now. That's money. You got to stand one step closer. If I was stressed or if I had anxiety, I would go to basketball or any type of sport because it just helps me stop thinking about that stuff. But perhaps the biggest impact of all is the peer community that New York Edge fosters. When it's hard, they'll always like have your back. They will always be there for you. A great program to help these kids adjust. Someone else here to help these kids and parents, child and family psychologist, Dr. Jen Hartstein. Welcome, thank you for talking with us this Thanks morning. Thanks for having me. I feel so many parents right now just glued <laughs> to ready. the monitor just to hear what you have to say. So listen, New York Edge obviously is a fantastic program, um, but not all schools have programs like this. So how can we as parents make sure that our kids transition to middle school is as smooth as it can be? And it's gonna be challenging, right? This is a big change for many people. And I think that's the word of the day when we think about middle school is change. And I think the most important thing to do is talk to your kids, sit mm -hmm. down, talk to them, ask them what they're excited about, ask them what they're worried about, ask them how they're feeling in general, and really listen. And I think as adults in the lives of children, we use our own experiences to kind of help them. But this is their experience, and I think it's really important for parents to remember this is their experience. Don't think about how middle school was or wasn't for you. Maybe use those stories as mm -hmm. anecdotes, but let this be their experience and kind of sit and validate and hear and just be present and really like kind of be their hype man. What Get them excited about what might be coming because we don't really know what it's gonna look like. That's really good advice. I think a lot of us, it's not that we don't talk to our kids, but I never had like a conversation about, hey, things are gonna change for you. So yeah. I think that's really good advice. Can you talk about some of the biggest emotional and social um, challenges and academic differences that exist between elementary school yeah. and middle school? Yeah, and there are a lot. I mean, I think academically, we can think about the fact that most of the time, K through five, you have one teacher mm -hmm. and you stay in your desk and it's your desk and it's your space. And middle school, all of a sudden, we're changing classrooms. We have different teachers and for kids who maybe aren't so organized, that's mm -hmm. really hard. Yeah. And so we have to remember kind of how can we give them some strategies and some help in that area. Socially, are we changing schools? Are there new friends? Clicks develop. Old friends might not stay your friends because there's this new kid that they really are excited mm -hmm. about. Or you kind of join the basketball team and have a whole new social group. So there's more opportunities socially in middle school, good and bad. Have you been spying on me? Why are you telling me? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I live in oh your. I God. secretly live in your house. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question. I know a lot of people can relate to this. So let's say after the first few weeks of school, are there any signs to let you know, you know what, maybe they're not transitioning well? Yeah, I think we have to remember that emotions exist on a continuum. Most kids start with, my stomach hurts, my head hurts, I don't feel good. Most kids mm -hmm. don't necessarily know how to say, I'm really nervous, or I'm having a really hard time, or my That's friends good. aren't my friends anymore. Okay. So think about the somatic things that they tell you. Okay. And also, like, are they just not interested? Do they seem to be like taking their time in mm -hmm. the morning? And it's not typical adolescent taking their time, it's like dragging their feet. Mm -hmm. You're pulling them with a rope kind of to get out of the house. You know your kid best if your gut is saying something's up, chances are you're right, so listen to that. And don't be afraid to ask, hey, I'm worried about you. You don't seem okay. Yes. And then zip it, be quiet, and let them tell you. Thank you so much. Well, coming up, how to help your kids avoid academic burnout. Plus, rules, boundaries, and securing a close relationship with your teenager. Woo! Stay with us. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. We got each other now. Doesn't it just weekend. feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready, SG, you ready? Refresh and reorganize for fall. Start today. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Local meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? 
live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The transition from middle school to high school can be overwhelming for some students and an exciting new experience for others. We checked in with four rising freshmen in New York City to hear their hopes, dreams, and worries for the upcoming school year. Take a look. I'm looking forward to finding new friends. I'll be able to try new clubs, especially since I like to dance. I will join for the dance club. I'm most looking forward to the sports part of high school because I'm a basketball player. Well, I feel like everything is something to be nervous about. Definitely the different classes and like traveling through the hallways. I've heard that teachers are really strict. The seniors because people say that they like to make fun of the freshmen. I have no idea why, but I'm definitely scared of that. The first one that comes to mind would have to be High School Musical. I really hope it's not like that. I don't want to sing everywhere. That's really weird. I always feel like there's going to be that one crowd where it's always like the it girls, the popular ones, and there's always going to be that little group where the nerdy squads, which I would fit in. You can't sing with us! I feel like high school is going to have more teachers being on you with more work. In one class you could be with your with one friend, but then the next class you're with someone who could be a junior. I feel like in high school, because you have that freedom, you really, you it's your choice if you want to follow the rules or break them. My mom, she would always tell me to not follow other people because like when you follow other people, they could lead you to bad situations. So it's better you just, you know, Stay your own ground and be by yourself most of the time. Be smart with who you hang out with because it really depends. And if I hang out with a bad crowd, they're gonna make me do bad things. If I hang out with a good crowd, they're gonna make me succeed in life. John Burnett is here with me to help us navigate it all. He's a school counselor from Houston, Texas, with over 12 years experience working across education. This year, he was a semifinalist for the Texas School Counselor of the Year Award. School counselors are some of my favorite people on the planet, so I'm happy to have yeah. you here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, thank you for what you do. So let's dig in here. So you think high school, you automatically think football games, <laughs> standardized tests, maybe yes. a little romance here and there. But I think it's important for us to talk about personal and emotional developments yeah. for high schoolers. How does it change when you get to this age? That is such a crucial time in their lives and there's so many things that are going on. Uh, they're being introduced to academics, of course, they're into a brand new school building and so there's a lot of different changes going on and it's really important for them to understand that they have a support system. First of all, before they even get there, which is why it's a good time we're running this special, yeah. how can parents prepare their kids if their kids are going into this this set of life? I always say that it's a good idea for families to sit down and create goals for their students. Mm. Um, just listen to them and figure out what they want to do. Because of course with high school, they're going to be introduced to a lot of different classes. Of course, they're going to have their core content area classes, but then they have electives so they can choose all their interests. So if they're interested in painting or art, they can go into that field and figure out if that's what they want to do in their life. If we're talking to our kids, they're figuring out who they yes. are. What does it look like at its best? So I always say that it's important for a, for a a student to feel like they're a part of the community. Mm -hmm. And one way to do that, especially going into a new building, is joining clubs, um, doing uh, like art, music, band, joining the choir or theater. 
there's so many ways to get involved in school so that you actually feel like you're a part of the community. That's going to make the transition to high school so much better, and it's going to be easier for that student and the family, honestly. I think it's really good advice. When you're isolated, that's when some of the troubles start. It does. John Burnett, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Coming up, Al's youngest child goes to college. Stay with us. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Welcome back. I'm Al Roker. Now we're going to end with one of our kids' biggest milestones, college. Not only are our kids moving on, but for a lot of them, moving out. It's a big transition for young adults and parents, including me. My, my youngest son, Nick, is leaving us this fall, making Deborah and I empty nesters. Well, Natalie Kane experienced this firsthand when her daughter left California for Skidmore College on the East Coast. Overwhelmed with the emotions and change that come with her only child going off to school, she sought help for her own life, but quickly realized she wanted to help others. And within a few months, her organization, Life in Transition, was born. I have to keep reminding myself it's a positive transition nonetheless. And she's our baby. And this is really hard. Friends said, oh, you better get used to being an empty nester. These families are part of an empty nest support group facilitated by life transition coach, Natalie Kane. Empty nest syndrome is a time of curiosity and grieving. And each family is unique in the way they experience this stage of their life. Natalie came to this work in 2004 when her only child, Rachel, was a senior in high school. I was at a parent meeting with the headmaster principal and he said, okay parents, you're gonna be empty nesters and it's gonna be hard. And I went, oh my God, I think I'm gonna start a support group for us, would you come? Natalie's first support group consisted of seven soon to be empty nesters. They met once a week as all of their children navigated the ups and downs of the first year away from home. And then the mother said, you've got to open this up for everyone. You've got to build the website and you've got to put this out there so other people have support. Natalie did just that. She left her career as a speech therapist to focus on her newfound passion. 90% of the parents, when they would call, would ask me, is this normal, Natalie? Why am I so down? Why is it I don't want to do anything? And why do I feel so lost? Nearly two decades later, she continues to run empty nest support groups virtually and in person. One of those community members, Amy Westrom. She found Natalie after struggling with loneliness and depression during her daughter Sasha's first year away from home. Friends had warned me about it. They said, oh, you know, you're going to be all alone. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I realized in the middle of the school year how much it was affecting her. With the help of Natalie's empty nest support group, Amy has found coping strategies. To focus more on what I truly want to do, what I've ultimately wanted to do since college is join the Peace Corps. So I'm now looking into the Peace Corps and, um, and we'll see. 
Through her support groups, one-on-one sessions, and speaking engagements, Natalie has been sharing her wisdom with thousands of families, reminding us all it truly takes a village every step of the way. A tip for you maybe is what worked for me and some of the other parents is to know that you really can trust them. You've taught them your values, and if they really need help and something's up, they're gonna call you. Well, I give you all a big hug. We'll be in touch again soon, and thank you for being with us today. Thank Take you. care. Thanks, Natalie. Someone else ready to help? Harlan Cohen. He's the author of The Naked Roommate and 107 Issues You Might Run Into in College. It's part of a series of books that he's written that looks at college life with advice for both parents and students. Harlan, good to see you. It's, great to, it's great to be here. Uh, what's your first piece of advice uh, for parents who are going through this for the first time? This is a big change for everyone, mm -hmm. and I think especially for parents, uh, they're so used to being part of their kids' lives, right. and all of a sudden they're far away. And this idea of getting comfortable with the uncomfortable is really the theme. The idea of renaming this first year the getting comfortable year mm -hmm. so that the expectations are that you're going to go through some transition and everything's not going to be perfect because this is a big year of change socially, emotionally, physically, financially, academically. Right. And if discomfort's part of it, it makes it easier for your kid to navigate this change. You, you talk about like the three P's, uh, people, places, and patience. Uh, yes, it's really important for a student when they're going to school to think, okay, where are my places? Places are where I'm gonna sweat, play, pray, live, learn, lead, love, work. So places are where we share experiences with people mm -hmm. and we build friendships and relationships. Sure. And then who are your five people? Who are the people who are gonna be in your corner? We're talking advisors, we're talking therapists, we're talking upper class, we're talking anybody who is a peer leader. And then patience, this idea, it doesn't take two weeks or two months. It could take a good year for a student to really find their way in their new surroundings. You know, one of the things that I, I know, look, I've been guilty of, we, we want to solve our problem, our kids' problems. You know, yeah. we've been kind of used to that. Uh, but now they're going to be on their own. When your son or daughter calls and says, uh, this happened or that happened, yeah. what's the best way to approach that? Okay, the first thing is uh, you decide if you want to answer the phone. Okay, <laughs> that, that's important. Caller ID is a good thing. Right, sometimes you just don't want to be bothered. But then if you pick it up, you could say, uh, are you looking to vent if they're having an uncomfortable situation or are you looking for advice? Because a lot of students just want to dump their problems on you and vent. But then if there's a problem, it's the 24 hour rule. As long as it's not, you know, life-threatening, an emergency, uh, but just giving it 24 hours to let them process. And if they have a hard time with that, reminding them, who are your people, where are your places? How often do you do a check-in? You know, yeah. And I, I assume that depends on the kid. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I don't think there's any rule. It's more of a question with Nick. And I, and I like starting the conversation with the, with the student, with the, with the kid, and saying, hey, how frequently do you want to check in? Mm -hmm. Because then they have the power to tell you. And also if they say, never, that's important. <laughs> if they say once a week or twice a week, and they're texting you every single day, well, all of a sudden, wow, that's interesting. So at least having a minimum, starting with them, and then saying, you know, I'd love to check in you know, a few times a week, or we can text a certain day. Parents have to be flexible because student schedules are moving, and if your kid has to talk to you and can't be in a room doing cool things with interesting people, then that's not really serving anybody. Right. Uh, so lastly, uh, and, and I, I don't mean to name drop, but I, I had an opportunity to interview President Obama. I took the opportunity to ask, what did you do when you dropped, you know, the girls off for the last time you know, or for that first time? What was that? And he said, here's what I do. You drop them off and then you run, make sure you're near the car and then ball your eyes out. Uh, uh, what, what's your advice uh, to parents who are going to be doing this, who are going to realize yeah. this is the last one? It's an empty nest. Uh, I've, I'm feeling I've got I've got a 16 year old, so it's getting close. You want to show emotion, but you don't want to show so much emotion that you need to be taken away in an ambulance, okay? <laughs> because then you're the center of attention. Some parents are just cold and the kid's like, don't you love me? So this idea of finding a happy medium, but also not making it so you're so distraught that you become the focus, because it's really about your child and yeah. them having their experiences. Well, Harlan, the great advice. Harlan Cohen, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And we want to thank you for joining us. Good luck to all the kids, all the parents out there. 
starting school. I'm Al Roker. We will see you next time on Today All Day. them to focus and try to build on positive performance and not focus so much on the bad things that happen because we're all going to have bad things that happen but our ability to overcome those negatives is going to go a long way in helping us be successful. Coach Nick Saban knows what it takes to be a champion. Throughout his historic 42-year college coaching career, 16 seasons at Alabama, he's produced more NFL first round draft picks than any other college coach. Quarterback Bryce Young won the Heisman Trophy as a sophomore. Fans are looking to him to deliver another championship. For Nick Saban to get his players to that level, the work doesn't just take place on the field. We sat down with him to talk about his work behind the scenes. First of all, thank you for doing this, sitting down with us. We Glad really appreciate it. it. I wonder, and just going back and thinking about your career as a football coach, was there a moment when you thought, we really need to start talking about mental health in a much more open way than we do with our athletes. Well, I think it started back for me when I was actually going to graduate school. And I got a, um, had a concentration in sports psychology. So I've always had an interest. And therefore, it's been probably 25 years ago, before there was a lot of attention given to mental health, that we were actually trying to provide services for players who may have had some kind of a, a mental health issue to whatever degree. How have you seen players' willingness to talk about it change over the years? Well, I think that in the beginning, a lot of times when we would make suggestions to players that we would like for you to talk to our psychiatrist or sports psychologist, there was kind of a negative sort of reaction to that like you think something's wrong with me is that why you want me to do this and uh, so sometimes it took a little bit of convincing that this was something that I do on a regular basis and talking to somebody to try to help my psychological disposition to be successful to not have issues that will be impediments to me being able to do things the way I'd like to do them so more recently I think players have been more forthcoming uh, in terms of sharing what their issues might be, uh, which has been better because we can accommodate them because we have the resources to do that. You know, a whole mental health you know, service here available to the players. How important is that moment when a player gets injured and they're looking at missing games or even missing a season? How important is that moment for trainers to step in and say, this is about whatever your injury is, but it's also about where your head may be. Well, I think that, first of all, we live in sort of a result-oriented world. And, you know, people create a lot of anxiety for themselves by thinking about what they want in the future. Example, simple example for a football player would be, I want to play in the NFL someday. So if that's what they focus on, they create a lot of anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis because they're thinking of the result. They're thinking of the outcome. Where if you can get players to focus on what does it take to get the outcome and let that be their focus. Then when they have issues like an injury, we try to get our players to look at the injuries as this is just a setback. You know, this is an opportunity for you to overcome adversity how you manage setbacks is also very important to how successful you're going to be. And sometimes they do need help in terms of how do we manage this. Mm -hmm. You talk about anxiety, but it's also a conversation about pressure too. And all college athletes face pressure, perhaps no college athlete more than the football player here at Alabama. How do you have a conversation with them in managing that pressure? You know, pressure is kind of self-inflicted. 
and it's self-inflicted because you're focused on result. All right, we want to focus on winning a championship. Or do you want to focus on what do I have to do each day to be able to be a champion so we'll have a chance to win a championship? There's a lot less anxiety in the second approach. A lot more anxiety when you're worrying about what's going to happen in the future. So um, that's how we try to do it. And we want all the people here to be the best that they're capable of being as a person, as a student, and as a player. And that's a conversation even before the bad things happen that you're having with players. Absolutely, all the time. Because we want to be process-oriented. And everything that we do here is process-oriented. You told me that you went around this building, and it was an amazing building. But there's no signs up that says win the national championship. There's no signs up that say win the SEC championship. There is a sign up that says be a champion. So we're trying to even philosophically get guys to focus on a culture of what do you have to do to be successful at what you want to do. How tough is it to get that message through when you are perhaps an athlete like Bryce, who's now had this incredible season, who has the Heisman? The expectations are through the roof for him. How do you bring him back down to the ground? Well, I think... You know, when you talk about expectations, you're talking about outcomes. And again, the best thing Bryce can do is focus on a day-to-day -day basis on what do I have to do to play well? What do I have to do to play to my best of my capabilities? And what everybody else thinks and all the external noise that's created out there, which create expectations, we try to get not to impact a player uh, because that's just going to create a lot of anxiety for you. I mean, we've all been through that. You know, when you walk into a room and you have an expectation and everybody has an expectation for you and you don't have focus on what you're supposed to do, it, it, it really can be a problem. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. You know, a decade ago, players didn't have to deal with social media the way that they deal with it now, and college athletes just in general. How has that changed the dynamic when it comes to mental health for your players? I think it, uh, from our standpoint, is, you know, you want to be satisfied with yourself. Are you satisfied that you know you did your best to be the best you could be at what you're choosing to do? What's important to you? And how do I have to edit my behavior to be able to do that? Or am I getting all my positive self-gratification from what everybody else thinks? Mm. And if that's the case, then, you know, maybe it's more difficult for me because it really should be about how do I feel about myself? Do I know I'm being the best that I can be? I'm making good choices and decisions. It's going to help me do the things I need to do. Or am I just getting self-gratification from what everybody else thinks, positive or negative? And how do those things affect my performance? I mean, a player for this team, when something goes bad on the field, it's not just a couple of people. I mean, they have hundreds or thousands of people in their DMs telling them pretty hateful things. What effect does that have? Well, I'm sure it doesn't have a positive effect, but I think, again, you have to go back to being technical. 
okay, why did this happen and what can I do to fix it? Rather than being so focused on the criticism or what everybody else thinks, because you control your thoughts, you control your feelings, you control what you say, you control what you do. So the more we can get players to focus on that, I think the better chance they have to be able to have success as well as overcome adversity. I tell players all the time, if you're going to be a great competitor, there can be no great victories in life unless there's adversity because that's what makes it a great victory. So your ability to manage that is very important for you to be successful. When you talk about adversity, do you talk about the challenges that they may have and kind of put mental health in that same basket on the same level as the other things that they may face? No question. You know, there's so many guys that have issues that are created by some expectation that they have and their inability to focus on what they need to do to be able to fulfill the expectations that they have. You know, like we have players on our team that instead of being focused on being the best player they can be and control what they can control, they're looking over their shoulder at how am I doing versus the next guy. You know, Coach, you've talked a lot about performance, and everyone knows your guy likes to win. But the stories that I've been hearing today, it's about more than just performance. It sounds like you care about these players. No, there's no question. Um, we, we, you know, our whole goal here is... Is a player going to be more successful in life because he was involved in the program? That's what kind of person is he? What kind of character does he have? Does he succeed in developing a career off the field by how he does in school? And if his goal is to develop a career as a football player, you know, how are we helping him do that? But I think athletics offers a lot of lessons of life, whether it's hard work, perseverance, ability to overcome adversity, pride in performance. You know, all these things are things that I don't care what you choose to do. They would be things that are necessary to be able to do to have success. How tough is it for a player who doesn't go to the NFL after coming from this program or a player who gets injured and no longer plays again? How do you, how do you prepare a player for that kind of disappointment? I don't know that there's any way to maybe prepare them for it. Um, you know, we all have things that are disappointing. And as much as we can help players be able to deal with those things, and I'm a coach, but we have people who are psychiatrists, we have people who are psychologists, uh, we have a lot of mental health experts that we've used for a long, long time that are much better at doing this or helping us be able to know how to do it. I think that's been one of the biggest things with our mental health is they tell us the best way that we can manage a player in terms of helping him be successful based on his personality type and some of the issues that they have. And one size doesn't fit all in how, how you approach people. So not having that information, not having mental health services, we, we may not ever know that. So that's um, been very beneficial through the years in terms of helping us help people. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. And who's this? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it.
These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. We've got each other now. Doesn't oh, it weekend. just feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready. SG, you ready? Refresh and reorganize for fall. Start today. You sort of see it for student athletes kind of across the board as they come in with this expectation that they're going to be perfect. And I wonder if you've noticed that change over the years. Has it, has it become more intense for student athletes in this country? I think probably because there's more attention. Social media has probably done something to do that. I think because we have all those things, sometimes these expectations are created externally, you know, maybe not internally. So you feel like you have to live up to something. I had a player years ago. Uh, I was actually in Julio Jones's class. And Julio Jones is starting in the first game. The other guy's still a third team guy. He comes to me before the first game. And he says, Coach, I'm really frustrated that I'm still 13. And I said, well, who are you better than? And he says, well, I'm not really better than anybody. And I said, well, what are you frustrated about? He says, everybody thinks I should be playing. So to your point, that's a perfect example of external expectations impacting someone's frustration in terms of their ability to stay focused on the things that they need to do to improve. But do you think that we've kind of lost the plot a little bit when it comes to the intensity that we drive in, in children in this country and, and sports? Um, is, there, is there a philosophy around children and athletics that has changed in this country that is potentially tough when it comes to mental health. I think specialization has created that. And what do you mean by that? Well, I always tell guys, when you're in high school, do everything you want to do. You know, people think I got to focus on being a football player from the time I'm in the ninth grade. But I like playing baseball, I like playing basketball, I like playing, you know, hockey, whatever it is. You should do all those things. But we tend to specialize when someone's 11 years old and they're good at something, we're going to make them be a professional golfer. We're going to make them be a professional tennis player. So what does that kinda, do? Well, I think it can potentially burn people out, yeah. you know, at a young age, because now they feel this pressure and expectation that they have to work so hard at trying to do something that can become a real grind. I think you should, you know, sort of enjoy things until you figure out, what do I really want to be? And should parents in this country reflect on that too? I think so, uh, and I think that we need to be careful about how we push people, at a young age especially, before they've had the opportunity to have the experiences to decide for themselves exactly, you know, what do I want to make this huge commitment to? Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. We've got each other now. Doesn't it weekend. just feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready. SG, you ready? To refresh and reorganize for fall. Start today. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were 
are still in Kiev. Could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. What lessons do you think other universities can take from your experience here in Alabama when it comes to mental health? Well, I think we've done this for a long time. Maybe it was just me thinking that I need help. I need help understanding the relationships that I want to be able to develop with players. So I need to know who those players are. And sometimes that's difficult for me to figure out with guys coming from all kinds of different socioeconomic backgrounds and all those things that we want to help them from here to get to a, a, a very good place. So we've done this for years, but I would recommend that everybody um, have psychiatrists, sports psychologists, people in mental health areas to be able to help their student athletes uh, be the best version of themselves personally, academically, and athletically. I think it's a tremendous advantage to helping people. Is it tough to get th these big, tough, super successful football players to talk about touchy-feely stuff? I don't think it's as difficult now uh, as it used to be because I don't think the players really look at it as I have something wrong with me. They look at it more like Maybe I could use the help. And it's always good to emphasize with people, take help when help is there to be given. It's not a bad thing. Senior defensive lineman DJ Dale asked for help after experiencing a season-ending knee injury. I was depressed and I didn't even know it. Well, I knew it, but I didn't want to admit it to myself. Dale went to Coach Saban. He told me that he appreciated me and that he knew I was a tough player. I didn't want him to think that I was like, you know, weak or turning my back against the team, but it was the complete opposite. He's back on the field now, but studies show injuries can trigger depression and other emotional responses, like changes in appetite and lack of motivation in athletes. Dr. Brett McCabe worked with Dale. He's the university's sports psychologist. He's part of a team of more than 20 trained behavioral health professionals at Alabama. There's so many wonderful stories of college athletes that have gone on to, you know, been prominent surgeons, attorneys, um, business owners, philanthropists, and everything. Mm -hmm. And those are the stories I love to hear because when the when the lights turn off, our fans move on to the next generation of players. But these players are still coming back, and they've got their business, their life, their families that are going on, and we want to make sure they're balanced. The transition into college can be overwhelming for any student. And for athletes arriving at the University of Alabama, there's an added pressure. What is it like? showing up as a freshman at this football program and playing in that stadium for the first time. It's surreal. Getting here was a big culture change and just seeing how much people care about football. You come out of the locker room, you get to hear 100,000 plus people. Um, you know, you see the lights when it's a, a night game, stuff like that. It's surreal. I, I can't even describe it. To help athletes adjust to the spotlight, Dr. McCabe works with students from the outset of their college career. How do you start talking to them ab about mental health and what's your message to an athlete who shows up here who's doing fine, mm -hmm. but who you know is going to face challenges they've never dealt with before? I think five or six years ago when I would give a talk on mental health, I may have one or two guys break away on the football team. One or two guys break away and come see me and say, hey, can I come see you later? Now when I give that talk, there will be 30, 40, because I really think because of the messaging that we're finding across the country where athletes are sharing, and I, I give a ton of credit to the Players' Tribune, the website, um, where players can own the story. If Michael Phelps or Simone Biles or Serena Williams or Kevin Love or DeMar DeRozan, anybody like that is sharing their own story, then that means that what I'm feeling is not abnormal. As a society, mental health is who we are. Our mental wellness is on point it, it's being lever it's being you know tested every single day particularly in the stresses of today's world and out here mm -hmm. tested in a way that most human beings aren't tested right correct correct you have a college athlete who's 19 years of age goes out there does everything he can and, and or she does and gets beaten in their sport on a play and a fan sends them a message a dm and is angry because of what they invested in their ticket their fandom 
and now they don't understand that that 19, 20 year old is still 19 or 20 and really doesn't have the life experiences to understand all the different factors. Everything in our athletes world right now is under a microscope and everything's evaluated. And how do they manage that? What, what is your message to them well, in those moments? You need to help them understand that there's an inside game and an outside game. The outside game we can't control. We can't control what fans say, media. All you can control is what you do in the moments that you can control, right? How do you prepare? How do you get ready? And if we can focus them on learning and growing, you know, for some reason in our world, we have this idea that, that the next challenge is the definer of all of our future challenges. And so for them, they sit there and they're like, well, I got this next challenge, this is the next thing. And yet they forget how far they've come and how much growth that they've developed. You can watch the maturation of our athletes here over the years that they're at the University of Alabama. And it's remarkable. It's a remarkable progression that you see as we get them ready for life outside of here. Has the pressure changed on a student athlete in say the last 10 years? And is it harder for them today? It seems like it is. I think the standards and expectations that we have for athletes is much higher than we've ever seen. It used to be that underclassmen were never even considered for the Heisman Trophy. And then Johnny Manziel wins it who was in his first year of playing, really, a significant role. So now that becomes the standard. If you have to take three or four years, are you behind the curve, right, in mm -hmm. theory? Mm -hmm. I think it also drives into the nature of who we are as people is that we're perfectionists, right? People great at their craft are perfectionists by nature. So that pressure is an internal drive. A lot of times it's really not what we do outside. Our standards have been the same from the very beginning. The difference is, is that our kids are coming in with more pressure, more standards to perform, and more expectations from the world around them. And it's not just football. It's everything. It, you know, when we talk about mental health, our priority in the conversation generally is about students coming forward, you know, having this open environment so they can talk about it. What is the responsibility of our society and the adults in creating this atmosphere, and what do we need to do about it? I think we got to open the dialogue in a much faster and proactive manner. We need to look for early warning signs. We need to understand that anxiety, depression gets a lot of attention, but anxiety is working behind the scenes in a much stronger way. I see anxiety rates that I've never seen before. We need to normalize the search for personal development and self-reflection and not see it as a negative, right? We have terrible mental health coverage in this country and it's very hard to find care for the general public, right? Um, and but so, don't we, I'm going to stop you for a second, don't we also have to have a conversation about dialing down the pressure on student athletes, whether it comes from absolutely. parents or coaches or just adults in general? I think, I, I don't know if that's a battle we can actually win though, because I think it kind of runs away on its own. What we need to do is better equip the tools of the people that are in those environments. Coaches self-disclosing themselves and coming forward and saying, you know, I see somebody and I work on this myself. That's the best way to model this. We can't change what the world demands of us, but what we can do is better equip ourselves for the tools of how we face those demands. Our relationship in this country to sports has changed, especially when it comes to kids. Sports are really serious yes. and it starts at a really young age. Do we have to start having a conversation about changing that? We need to focus on the kids that are different maturation levels, different developmental levels, and understand that every kid that shows up to the sport event is bringing different baggage with them. Mm. And we need to connect to them. I think it comes down to the organizations. I think the organizations need to get better resources, train better coaches, get more people involved. How about the parents? 100%. But parents, they love their kids so much they're crushing them. But at the same time, it's hard to not give them everything that's available to them, right? And demand a lot for them but we have to create balance. Whether a kid succeeds or struggles on the field, our behavior must never be connected to their athletic performance. That's the first place to start. When you have tough conversations with athletes and they talk about their parents, what are you hearing from them? They don't want to disappoint them. That's primary. And as parents, we need to make remember to give them that sometimes and let them know it's okay to not be okay and sometimes all you have to do is send a text to your kid and just say thinking of you love you and that goes a long way what are the lessons that other schools can learn from alabama i think there's a couple facets one is we see coach saban and the the pioneering leadership that he's had there's also some great individuals that are pushing the initiatives too our athletic trainers here are the primary port, uh, point people for our athletes. They are trained on how to focus on the mental health. This is not a mind versus body. This is a fully holistic approach. And we need to empower more athletic trainers to continue to take that role it, it, and believe in they're part of that role.
And on that note, I mean, an injury can be one of the most significant events that happens to a player's mental Absolutely. health, right? Yep. Detrimental. That's, when an athlete is injured, now they're taking away their comfort and their coping mechanisms, and now they're standing on the sidelines where somebody's replacing them and moving on. And so while they're cheering for the team, there's still that self-loss sometimes of, oh my gosh, they're going on without me. And so our athletic trainers, our sports medicine professionals, our teams are all integrated. And, and I give a lot of credit to our, our surgeons and our medical staff too, because instead of waiting for a problem, I'm involved from the minute that they have, you know, they're coming out of recovery or sometimes even prep for surgery to identify what the stresses are gonna be. What are the worries? Where are their coping mechanisms? Who do they trust? Who are the people around them? And how do we build that support to help them through that period of time? Thank you for your time. This is such a great conversation to be having. A big hello to everyone watching today all day. Hope you enjoyed the long holiday weekend. This is Pop Start Plus. I'm Joe Fryer filling in for Carson. On today's show, get ready to be transported to a European vacation. We're talking with two stars of the new movie, Love in the Villa. And yes, it takes place in Italy. After that, we're going to share our visit with one of our absolute favorites, Keenan Thompson. The SNL star is hosting the Emmys this year and updated us on his plans and his life. And later, a fun 90s look back with Hugh Grant. But first, his pop start. Let's get to it. We're starting off with Luckiest Girl Alive. We have an exclusive first look at the trailer for the upcoming best-selling book-turned-movie. It's based on the novel by Jessica Knoll. Mila Kunis stars as a woman who seems to have it all until her past comes back to haunt her. Take a look. I'm working right on a documentary about the incident at your high school. There are still so many questions that you've never answered. People want to know, were you a hero or an accomplice? Imagine what it's going to be like when they find out about what happened. How could you not tell me about this? I carried this horrible thing with me alone for years, and it has built up this rage inside of me. Run, get out! Don't touch me! I don't know what's me. I'm what part I invented. Mm. Oh, I want what I invented? Is that mm. what she said? That's oh. a dark one. I read that book, Ooh, and I don't remember anything <laughs> that happened, but I remember <laughs> it being good. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. Refresh your yes. memory. Wow. Um, you can catch good. the full trailer on Today.com. Mila will also join us on September 28th to talk about her role in Luckiest Girl Alive. Premieres on Netflix on October 7th, so there's still time to read cool. the book yes. before the movie. <laughs> All right, next up, Julia Roberts and George Clooney. The iconic pair is gearing up for the release of the upcoming movie, Ticket to Paradise. They play a divorced couple teaming up to try and stop their daughter's wedding. Here's a peek. I think your things are in my seat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, come on. You've got to be kidding me. Excuse me, ma'am. I need to sit somewhere else. We used to be married. Worst 19 years of my life. We were only married for five. I'm counting the recovery. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking forward to that one. In real life, everyone knows Roberts and Clooney are longtime friends. The pair actually opened up to the New York Times about working together, joking that a single kiss between them took six months to shoot. It took 79 takes of us laughing, and then the one take of us kissing, Roberts joked. Ticket to Paradise hits theaters October 21st. That's going to be a good one. 80 takes. Can you imagine trying to do a kissing scene with one of your best friends? No. Like, that's just... George Clooney is hysterical. Yes. yes right? I couldn't even imagine. All right, next up. Don't worry, darling. <laughs> darling, we're going to keep the movies going here. The psychological thriller. It premiered at the Venice Film Festival last night, bringing together the biggest stars of the film, Harry Styles, Florence Pugh, and Olivia Wilde. They all hit the red carpet alongside their co-stars to promote the upcoming movie. Now, as fans wait for the movie's release, we all know they're there have been rumors of a falling out between the lead, Florence Pugh, and director Olivia Wilde. Well, Olivia addressed, addressed the rumors uh, at a press conference yesterday. Take a look. I can't say enough how honored I am to have her as our lead. She's amazing in the film. And as for all the endless tabloid gossip and all the noise out there, I mean, the internet feeds itself. I don't feel the need to contribute. I think it's sufficiently well-nourished. <laughs> that's true. And that's that. Well said. Okay. Yes. Don't worry, darling. Hits theaters on September 23rd. Okay. Okay, next up, the NFL. We've been talking about it all morning. It's a big week for football fans, and we've got a lot to get to. So let's kick off with an exclusive first look at a new video from the NFL showing how the league is gearing up for this season. Okay. 
Lil Wayne's in it, Saweetie's in oh. it. Uh, they all teamed up for that legendary pep rally to celebrate the start of the season. If you want to watch the whole thing, wow. you yes, can we do. go to today.com for the full video. I'm going immediately. And see that. It's fun. It gets you fired up. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. it's September now. Oh, yeah. We're ready for Let's football. Let's do it. Season. All right, and also making his return to the NFL, Tom Brady. We haven't talked about him in a few days. Uh, the star quarterback opened up about his decision to return to football on his Sirius XM show. Let's go. Take a look. I just felt like I had a little left, and I want to give it a shot. And I owed it to my teammates and uh, our great coaches and our whole organization. We built something pretty special here in Tampa the last few years. The competitive fire still burns, and I want to get out there, and I want to have a great season for everybody because there's a lot of people that have supported me along the way. And if you want one more reason yeah. to look forward to the NFL season, yeah. Ozzy Osbourne. What? The He's rock returning? legend is set to take the stage during halftime at this oh. Thursday's season kickoff between the LA Rams and the Buffalo Bills. It's actually his first U.S. appearance and performance since 2019. Of course, you can catch the kickoff game. It's this Thursday right here on NBC. Wait, a halftime musical show? I mean, oh, the yeah. first game? Oh. There's more you need to know, starting with Andy Cohen. Everyone loves to show off their happy sun-kissed family photos after a good vacay. But our buddy Andy, well, he's keeping it real in a new video from inside the tough car ride home with his kids. Ben, you just watched Bob the Builder for six hours while I packed the car up. You can't want to watch more. We're going back to the city. You've been wanting to go back to the city. What? Okay, okay. Do you feel better now? Um, no. I, I still have a cold. Well, you what? I was just kidding. You were just kidding. <laughs> wow. Ah, uh, the many highs and lows of being three years old. Congrats to all the parents who survived this summer and cheers to going back to school. And finally, Leah Michelle, the multi-talented actress, is getting ready to take the stage as the lead in the Broadway show Funny Girl. Entertainment Weekly revealed these first look photos of Michelle as Fanny Bryce. As she prepares for her first show, Leah says she's over the moon and so nervous at the exact same time, describing the role as a dream come true. Leah Michelle's run in Funny Girl begins tonight at the August Wilson Theater here in New York. And that is the latest for you today. Coming up, the stars of Love in the Villa give us a glimpse into shooting in real life Verona, Italy. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. Wake up each other now. Doesn't it weekend. just feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready, SG, you ready? Refresh and reorganize for fall. Start today. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. What would you do if you arrived for a European vacation and your Airbnb was double booked? 
Well, that's what happens in a new movie called Love in the Villa. And two of its stars spoke to the fourth hour's Donna Farazin about shooting in real life gorgeous Verona, Italy. This is the movie we all need right now. We need romance. We need Italy. I love that you two, you know, you actually shot the film in Italy. What was it like being in that romantic and historic setting? It's yeah. incredible. I think we both said, right, that it's the best filming experience we've ever had. I mean, it's just incredible. It was a dream. It was an absolute dream. Uh, there were so many locations, the people, the food. It was, it was magical. Ah! 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 What? Who are you? Who am I? What are you doing here? I'm sorry, are you insane? You've just walked in here. Wait, jeez. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I rented this villa for the week. Look, I'll prove it to you. See, Julie Hutton, house and host. Nice to meet you, Charlie Fletcher. Vacay stay. I mean, when I was watching it and the characters, you know, at first you didn't want to be together. I'm like, come on, these two gorgeous people. I would totally be like, sign me up to be overbooked with the, either of you two. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> would you, in real life, if you were overbooked in a villa, would you stay or would you go? I would put up a fight. I'd be like, you gotta go. <laughs> There with you after I just got dumped? No, I need space. <laughs> I, I'd probably like invite, I'd probably do what Charlie does later on and I'd be like, go, listen, let me cook you dinner. We'll go out, we'll have some drinks. You know, actually, what? because it's based on a true story because this actually happened to Mark Stephen Johnson. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. It was based off like an event where he went to Paris and met uh, a woman in a, in, a, in a villa that was an Airbnb. But they didn't have a romance, but they yeah. became really good friends. They're still in touch now. Well, nothing beats the romantic aspect of it. Um, I think everyone dreams of this type of scenario for themselves. Would you say that you, Tom, are more of a Charlie then? I'm probably close to Charlie, um, sort of in the latter stages of the movie, yeah. I mean, I'm certainly not as rude as Charlie is early on, but uh, in terms of like my planning and things like that, yes, I'm, I'm quite sort of, let's go with the flow. Don't worry about it. We'll just, we'll just deal with it when we get there. Kat, are you well organized or more go with the flow? <laughs> what are you laughing at, Tom? Because I know, I know the oh, answer. Man. Answer the questions as you know. She is Julie. <laughs> well, you know what, Kat? Being Julie has gotten you very far in life. So congratulations. Compulsive successful is what I like to call it. Um, but I have a sense stopped planning as much and I've learned to go with the flow. I no longer laminate my itineraries and I don't use my journal every day. So I'm doing better and better and better, especially when it comes to my personal life. There's so many elements in this movie. There's heartbreak, there's falling in love, there's being independent. Do you have any lessons in heartbreak, in dealing with heartbreak or in dealing with not settling? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, Tom's saying I am this character. It's not just the character. It's I had a breakup. We got back together in Verona. This was years ago. My ex fiance's name is Brandon. Darren, my now fiance, is allergic to cats. There's there were things that were in that that the crew built in our actual villa. They had no idea it was the same thing I have in my house. There were weird things like that. Um, so, and I'm a spiritual person, so Me I think- Me too! I'm like, did you manifest this? What's happening? I think God uses my art as a way to get me to deal with myself or to teach me lessons, to deal with the things that scared me. If I could give anyone any advice, it's to just be open and stop trying to control everything and um, follow your heart. And it sounds really corny, but I've learned so much about allowing myself to just fall in love and, and be happy. Wow, Kat, I loved that so much. You know, it was so funny when I was watching the movie, I didn't realize at first, Tom, that 
your girlfriend was your wife in real life, Laura. Yeah. Sharing a screen and a set with her. I know that you've done this before, but in, in this romantic setting of Italy, like, what was that like? Oh my God, amazing. Um, just, the, I mean, it was the first time actually as well that we'd been away uh, together alone without our children for a bit. So to go away and do a movie together, doing the thing we both love was amazing. What are you most excited for people to see when they're watching Love and Vanilla? I think, well, I kind of feel that Verona is a hidden gem of Italy, actually, for most people. I think when people go to Italy, they think of Rome, they think of Milan, they think of Venice. And for me, Verona is the one. It's, I think I, I want people to watch it and go, oh my God, is that what that city looks like? How are more people not going there? Because it's still relatively quiet, so I also hope I don't destroy it by having more tourism there, because it's kind of beautiful, it's not overcrowded. Um, but it's just uh, endless sights, like sight after sight after sight and view after view, it's just incredible. Pat, if you could describe Love in the Villa, in a sentence or two, how would you describe it? It's a movie about conquering yourself and believing in destino. We should mention you can catch Love in the Villa on Netflix. Up next, the hilarious Kenan Thompson's visit to Studio 1A. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline. Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Thanks for sticking with us here on Pop Start Plus. Kenan Thompson always brings a huge smile when he visits us here on Today. And during his latest visit, he talked about hosting the Emmys, SNL, and more. Keenan Thompson has been making us laugh for decades. Yeah, he first broke onto the scene. Guess how long ago? Keenan, guess. 30, 30 years oh, ago, starring snap. in classics like Nickelodeon's that All That and the baby. Mighty Duck movies. <laughs> the tiny, oh, and they're, they're my favorite right there. Today, Keenan continues his reign as the longest running cast member in Saturday Night Live history. Next week, Keenan will take the stage as the host of the 74th Emmy Awards right here on NBC. Keenan. You know what Savannah and I have been singing? What's, what's up with that? Oh, yeah. Keenan, what's mm -hmm. up with that? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. What's up with that? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Good morning. Well, good, good morning. morning. So, good morning. what do you do? How do you get ready for the Emmys? Um, a lot of like phone calls back and forth to yeah. figure out like what it's going to be. But uh, a lot of joke writing. Like the writers are like really writing a lot of jokes and 
trying to figure out who wants to do bits and stuff like that. You know what, what I mean? What do you mean? Like other people are going to join you? Yeah, like the famous folks. You know what I'm Ooh, saying? Like uh-huh. who's, who's down to who? do something funny. Uh-huh. Whoever's in the room, you know, we've been reaching out to a lot of different people. Um, all my, like, SNL brothers and sisters that'll be in the building, I'm sure, are going to be down for, for, for whatever. Uh-huh. Um, but... It'd be nice for like you know the elders, like the Sedacuses of the world, to, to <laughs> the, do some stuff. The, the, the haters of the world, you yeah. know. Um, but also, um, you know, anybody. Like, like I feel like you know we've been reaching out to people like Kamel and like maybe Lizzo and stuff. I've been hearing. So these are all like, you know, unconfirmed but hopefully confirmed okay. kind of like things. Well, after you mentioned Lizzo. We heard that you were hoping to do like a big musical number. Yes. Mm-hmm. How's, mm-hmm. Is, do you think that's going to come together? It's coming together kind of oh. well. I mean, I think you kind of got to have some music in the name. You know, it's a grand academy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, you yeah. Uh, something so grandiose. A, a little hint about what that might be? How um, that might look? What can the hint be without yeah. giving it away? Um, I, it, it'll be an, um, kind of an e- eclectic gathering of tunes. If that, okay. If that's okay. A, a hint. Hint, oh. hint. <laughs> you do you, by the way, do you get nervous before something like this? You do live, obviously, you do live television all the time at SNL. Yeah, I feel it. I mean, I try to turn that, you know, nervousness, you know, wordage into, like, adrenaline mm-hmm. or something like that or, you know, testosterone. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel I feel it now, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, just knowing that, you know, it's Tuesday now and Monday is approaching and yeah. blah, blah, blah. It's just, like, always on my mind. So I'm just, like, ready to get it done. Uh-huh. Wow. You're going to crush it. Thank Full you. of faith. Thank and then you. you have your... Is it the 20th season, did we say, on SNL? Yeah, starting number 20. Oh, my Holy gosh. Holy. Yeah, crazy, right? So, like, what... You're staying power there. Yeah. yeah. I think I saw you on the Smart... Or you were on the Smart Smartless Smartless. podcast and you were like, yeah. I'll stay forever. Yeah. yeah, yeah I'll yeah, stay till you're 100. Will you? That's yeah. my mentality, you know? Like, it's just nice to be asked back. That, that's that been this ongoing thing, like... Who am I to deny them when they call? You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's such an institution. But, you know, it's it's my home, you know? And it's it's nice to have stability in life. So <laughs> I just like, you know, keep, you know, just stacking all these clips and, and looking back on it. It's Come the best on. in these moments. I was just on Kevin Hart's podcast, and we were talking about that sketch right there. Yeah. The Corner Boys. Uh-huh. And, you know, I'm just working with a lot of brilliant people, like the Mulaney's of the world, you know? So, how, do you, how do you know, like, how do you know how to do an Al Roker? Like, how do you even know it's how to do It's just what that? I, it's what I hear. Yeah. You know? So what do you <laughs> And like my, that? my kind of like, you know, if he was projecting, that's what I would be taking away yeah. from it. <laughs> but he's just so jolly. I was asking where, where he is a minute ago. I was I like, know. where is Roker at? Can you, you know, believe he's just he's out of such a presence. Uh-uh. And he's just so, he's always smiling. So that just makes <laughs> me feel like he's just very giddy. And he wants everybody to know what's going on in their neck of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. By the way, there's a, people love to write in and say, this is why I wish would be the guest host this mm-hmm. year. Some special guest host. Yeah. Kill Burnett's getting traction. Oh, that Carol would be Burnett. amazing. She's never done it. Crack. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. What do you think of that? I feel like that's a crime. You yeah. Know? <laughs> you know, she's an, an incredibly brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, Carol Burnett actually presented me Miami when we won. That oh. was amazing. She was the, the uh, presenter of that category. And that was the first time I've ever even been close enough to even, like, Mm-hmm. Imagine touching Carol Burnett. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it was, it was an amazing Wait, moment. We gotta so hit one she's got to do it. Yeah. yeah, you just got your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I sure did. How cool is that? Wow. Gold star for the kid. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was an incredible moment. It really was. Like Meaningful. very touching. Whole family. Yeah. Leslie came out. JB came out. Look at the babies were there. It was, the girls. It was the best. Yeah. It was. It was a great day. Yeah. It was, it was. It was. It was crazy to witness something like that and still feel so young, you know yeah. what I mean? It, it seems like such a end of the road kind of thing. I heard your neighbors but with Lauren Michaels on the on the Walk of Fame. Right next, he was right next to That's him. cool. That, that's so crazy. Like we had, you know, half of his name covered up because of the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> slightly disrespectful. <laughs> but yeah, that it, it's, it's just wild to, to think about, you know? Oh. Gotta love Keenan. And we should mention you can watch him as your Emmys host coming up on Monday night at 8 o'clock, 7 central on NBC. Next up, we're traveling back to the 90s with Hugh Grant. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just weekend. feel good to be back to it school? Does. Start today.
the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. NBC News, streaming free now. Well, many Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. And who's this? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Any Notting Hill fans out there watching? The 1999 romantic comedy star Julia Roberts and Hugh Grant. And in honor of Grant's 62nd birthday this week, a little something from the vault. His visit to today, all about the film. Hugh Grant, good morning. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. So this teams you up once again with the screenwriter and producer from four weddings and a funeral. That's right, yeah. Was it nice? Was it a nice reunion? Nice to be back with those people? Uh, well, it was. It was like getting back into a warm bath, you know, after uh, years in the wilderness of people, you know, giving me not such great uh, romantic comedies. And suddenly to have this great writing again was, uh, was fabulous. But um, having said that, it was very scary because suddenly it's a much bigger budget. I was going to say a and, much, uh, much, much bigger budget, well, right. right? And partly because we have this actress called Julia Roberts in it. Uh, which Who? Who? Someone called Julia Roberts. She's good. You watch out for her. She's, she's going to be big. And, um, you know, obviously everything suddenly becomes a different kind of ball game. So it's scary in that way. The uh, idea apparently came from screenwriter Richard Curtis's brain. He was uh, staying up one night thinking about what it would be like to suddenly have these two worlds collide. The, the most famous person in the world, which seems really right for a movie because... So, Society is so obsessed with celebrity right now. Yeah. Get together with somebody who really doesn't have a clue about popular culture, right? That's right, a non-entity and a rather sort of, um, as you say, naive non-entity. When you heard about this, this plot, I know that Julia said that she thought, I don't think this is such a hot idea. What did you think when you heard about it? Uh, no, I think that's a, a fascinating idea. I've always wondered, uh, you know, if that can really happen, a very ordinary kind of guy falling in love with a very, very famous woman or, or the other way around. And um, I think a lot of people are fascinated by the prospect of that. You know, would the spark or just the basic charm or whatever that chemistry is, can that vault over this great divide in, in, in terms of, you know, celebrity? And uh, I like to think it can. And Richard, who wrote the script, hates me telling this story. And in fact, I'll get into trouble for telling it again now on national television. But it, it did happen to a friend of his who was just an ordinary English guy shopping in Harrods, big department store in London. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so know I it. know what people know. I mean, I know what you know. It. Yeah, but you're right. A lot of people know um, that. So. And who met an unbelievably famous person whose name I can't reveal. Oh, come and on. Ended up, <laughs> no, that's why it's a sort of boring story as well as a naughty one. Uh, and ended up having a, a fling with, with her. And that became the basis or the germ of this film, I think. What was it like working with Julia Roberts? Were you at all intimidated at the prospect? Or did you all get on immediately no I think we were all terrified um, especially me I mean I had met her many years ago and uh, when she was going to do a film in London and I was a sad unemployed actor and um, I was one of many sad unemployed actors who she rejected threw away like so much trash for this film but uh, we got on very well at that thing and uh, I knew it would be all right in the end in this film but I it didn't make me it didn't stop me from being unbelievably nervous when she first showed up I was talking to her about the other actors uh, in the film too and uh, how important they really are to the whole mood yeah. of the movie. Um, were, were these people, she didn't know any of them before this film because right. they're all British, but were these people you knew or had worked with at all? Or um, I hadn't worked with them, but I knew who they were because they're all big uh, TV stars in England or yeah, you know, well-known in, in, in England. And uh, as you say, they're very important to the whole thing. It's like Four Weddings and a Funeral. It was like a sort of ensemble piece up to a, up to a point. And, uh, Richard Curtis, the author of the piece, is very keen on friendship and on, um, I don't know, just on a whole sort of bedrock of, of good supporting characters. And there's some hilarious performances. The guy who plays my uh, 
flatmate, my roommate in this, is uh, particularly hilarious. He is very funny, isn't yeah, he? Yeah. Um, you know, some people have said, here's Hugh Grant, once again playing Hugh Grant. I mean, you've heard <laughs> this a million times, Hugh. And, mm. and, and it must be frustrating for you to, to read that or hear that. You know, well, once again, he's playing <laughs> the affable, bumbling, romantic, right. lovable, right. shy, self-deprecating person. Yeah. What do you think when you, when you hear that or read it? Well, you're right. It is vaguely frustrating. I mean, because to anyone who actually knows me, um, I'm not that person. I'm, I'm a lot nastier than that. Uh, <laughs> Plus, in, in fact, I mean, for years, I, I, all I did was villains um, for all the way through the 1980s. And in these kind of situations, these interviews, people would say, why do you always play villains? Why are you always the same thing? So I think people like to hang you on a hook as an actor. It just so happens Richard's written two parts, which are actually rather like him. He's the author. And I just sort of ape him. And those two happen to have been the most successful that I've done. And there you have it, today's Pop Start Plus. And as always, we'll have much more for you tomorrow. Until then, take care. I'm Vicki Wynn. Thanks for joining me for Consumer Confidential Back to School Safety Guide. We're going to help you kick off a successful year from navigating the social scene to the great debate. Is your child ready for a phone? We'll also have an important lesson on how to stay safe on campus, especially if your student is away from home for the first time. In just a few minutes, we'll talk to Dr. Sue Varma on dealing with the anxiety of returning to school. But first, school safety is on the minds of many. We looked into some of the most effective measures. We aren't going to give away any secrets that could put your kids in danger, but we will show you some of the safety tactics used in schools today to potentially save lives. Nearly 50 million kids in the U.S. are headed back to class. And across the country, districts are approaching security differently. In Indiana, Jay County schools have gun safes on each campus, where trained staff have access with just a thumbprint. Clinton Public Schools in Mississippi added a fourth police officer. And in Las Vegas, El Dorado High School is set for a $26 million security upgrade with cameras, single point entry, and perimeter fencing. I'm here at White Plains High School in New York for an exclusive look at their campus security system. And with me is John LaPlaca. He's a consultant who works with schools across the nation. Let's talk about the security here. What's the first thing a visitor would notice? So as we approach the building, we're going to have a single locked point of entry for visitors. Uh, if they want to gain access to the building, the first step in the process would be they'd buzz in on the intercom system, which would be answered by security personnel inside. Hi there, it's John LaPlaca from Altaris. I'm here to visit the main office. So I've announced myself, and the security person has now given us access to the building, has buzzed us into the vestibule. But that's not it. We're stopped by a second set of doors where security scans our driver's license to cross-check against the sex offender registry and local banned persons lists. Okay, John, so now we're inside the school. What other security measures are in place here? So visible throughout the building, you'll see cameras. It also gives law enforcement the ability in an emergency situation to look at the cameras. What about the classrooms themselves? They have electronic locks, which will actually automatically lock in an emergency situation. Some of the best returns on investment for safety and security are things that cost nothing at all. Low-cost signs to help people provide 911 with their location and help responders outside find them. Oh, okay. Okay. We took part in an actual lockdown drill where teachers served as students. Assistant Principal Guy Vitiello, wearing this bright orange shirt, serves as a trespasser on campus. I'm in the classroom with teacher Daniel Furry, who shows us what happens when someone triggers the alarm. I'm going to activate the call. Okay. Students get to the safe zone. Students get to the safe zone. So you instruct your students to go back to the safe zone? Lockdown. Lockdown. Lock the doors. Stay away from the windows. Across campus, the alert can be seen and heard from these LED boxes. Furry is trained to quickly scan for nearby students before securing the room. So you go outside and make sure that there are no students in the hallway or you grab them to get into the safe zone? Correct. Okay. Come in, come in, get into the safe zone in the corner there. Lockdown, go in the room. In an actual lockdown, only law enforcement can enter the building. Today, school resource officers from White Plains PD enter through a back door closest to our trespasser. Now, when you close that door, Mr. Furry, does it lock automatically? It does lock automatically.
Police didn't want to reveal their tactical response, but told us the priority is to go straight to the trespasser and confront the security risk. The White Plains Police, can you tell us why you're in the building? Inside, everyone remains in lockdown. Only police can unlock the doors and let them out. As you stand here in the corner, what kind of goes through your mind? Thinking about the students, you know, and what, how they're feeling and how important it is to reassure them that when they're here, they're safe that we have systems for them to ensure their safety and their comfort and then reassuring them afterwards. White Plains Police Chief Joe Costelli says his department holds multiple training drills like this every year. These are decisions officers have to make in a split second. How important is training to that muscle memory? The more we do it, the more um, we will react in a crisis situation, a high stress situation. The time to train is not the time when the crisis is going on. The chief says everyone in the community can make the difference. See something, say something. Look, we want to help anybody who may be in distress. Superintendent Joe Ricca says planning, practice and communication is the critical first layer of security to keeping any campus safe. At the core of any strong security plan is always going to be the training training, training. And joining me now is board certified psychiatrist Dr. Sue Varma to help us ease into the school year and eliminate some of the anxiety that comes with a new year. Welcome Dr. Varma, thanks for being here. Thank you. Help us understand what are some of the conversations that we parents can have with our kids to ease some of their worries. So, you know, school safety is number one on everyone's mind, and the child may say, like, how can, I, how can I feel safe with all that's happening in the world? And I think it's really important for parents to have age-appropriate conversations. Depending on the kid, you may want to keep it very simple if we're talking about five to seven-year-olds, um, and older kids may want a little bit more information. But really having open-ended questions where you leave it to them to say, what are you worried about? Mm -hmm. So we're not projecting our fears and anxieties onto them, and then providing some le level of support and reassurance to say it's going to be okay, we'll figure this out. Because really that's what kids want to hear at the end of the day, that it's all going to be okay. What are some action statements that we can use if a kid says, you know, I'm kind of worried about my safety at school. Yes. What is something you can tell them that's concrete? Yes. So I would say, listen, like, let's have a safety plan. You know, I know that the, the idea of kids having cell phones is a big topic and maybe we can talk about that another day. But, you know, if the kid is age appropriate, like somewhere between 9, 10, 11, like I want to give my kids phones like as they're nearing that age. So say that you can contact me when you're in school if you don't feel safe if the school allows for it or for example if you're going to like an event and you're at a parade to say if we got um, separated at the parade where's the meeting point what is your address do you know your phone number because a lot of young kids don't know or can you look for like a familiar face in the parade or the event that you're going to so having very concrete tips and to say yeah. I'm going to the PTA meeting I'm going to find out at school what is the plan the yes. safety plan and we're going to get our local legislators involved we'll get the local police department involved so giving them some structure and confidence that you've got things figured out or you're going to figure figure them out with them. That makes sense. And giving them actual things to do and giving them knowledge, you know, information that you gather. Yes. That's super helpful. What are some of the other back to school anxieties that kids have? Because it's been a summer and maybe they're worried about their friends or just a new teacher, a new school. Yes. All of that. All of the above, like you said. You know, one thing is separation anxiety. Young mm -hmm. kids are going to feel like I've spent the whole summer with you and now we're not going to be together. I know the older kids, the teens and tweens may be like, I'm happy to peace out, right? <laughs> right. So the younger kids, um, that separation, if you can create a few moments in the in the morning to mm -hmm. say, listen, we're going to have everything ready. We'll have their lunches packed. Let's just watch some videos for a couple of minutes. Let's laugh. Let's like watch something on YouTube or TikTok, whatever feels family friendly to you. Mm -hmm. um, the other anxieties are fitting in. Body image mm -hmm. issues are a big deal nowadays yeah. as young people are on social media and feeling Especially like they're not. Especially for young girls. Absolutely not living up to standards. So finding them activities that make them feel body confident. Mm -hmm. Sports are a great way. Getting Keeping kids active throughout the summer so that they feel a sense of agency over their body, finding them clothes that fit if that's an issue, peer pressure, and like discussing a lot of this and recognizing that it's going to be evolving in real time, but keeping the door open, keeping interested, asking them questions. What are you watching? What are you doing? What are you worried about? Those, that's all such great actionable advice. Dr. Sue Varma, as always, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we talked about it there. The great debate coming up. Is your child ready for a phone? Plus, we'll look at the other gadgets your kids may need, which include laptops that are right for your family. Later, College Safety 101, the do's and don'ts of college life. Consumer Confidential, coming right back. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now.
the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it's known as the great debate. When are kids ready to have a phone? Parents want to be able to stay in touch with their children throughout the day, but owning a phone can open up a different set of headaches. Here's NBC's Kate Snow. The pandemic changed everything, including the way kids learned and spent their free time. According to Common Sense Media, screen use for teens and tweens has grown by 17% since 2019, with kids 8 to 12 clocking five and a half hours a day, and 13 to 18 year olds logging nearly nine hours a day on devices. Now many parents are pumping the brakes. For mom of four, Adriana Stacy, the family policy has always been firm. We don't buy smartphones for our children. She's a psychiatrist who's seen the effects of increased screen time in her practice. I'll get a patient in my office, usually a teenager, who all of a sudden started to really struggle with anxiety and depression. Pretty much every time we can trace that back to when did you get a phone? But her oldest, Annalise, a 10th grader, often feels left out. It's definitely hard sometimes because I have been like left out of decisions because I haven't been on a group chat or something. It's also been a struggle in the classroom. Some of Annalise's teachers ask students to use their smartphones to do classwork. We do feel like we're standing alone on an island. But the island is getting bigger. A movement called Wait Until 8th encourages parents to wait until at least 8th grade to give kids smartphones. The network is 40,000 families strong, and they've seen a 25% increase in participation in the last year alone. Parents have seen the impact of screens on kids over the past couple of years with online school and lots of social media consumption. Let's get our kids outside. Let's get our kids reading. Let's get our kids playing with other kids in real life. And let's let our kids enjoy being kids. Research about the impact of smartphones is mixed. A large study using data from the National Institutes of Health found screen time was moderately associated with worse mental health, increased behavior problems, decreased academic performance, and poorer sleep, but also found using a smartphone or device improved friendships and connection. Dr. Jean Twangy is a professor of psychology at San Diego State and author of the book iGen. Are we basically experimenting on our kids, not knowing what the impact of these smartphones will be long term? All of us are basically living in a big social experiment where smartphones have taken over. In effect, we're experimenting with their brains. Hey, let's give them all a smartphone and see what happens. Experts agree if parents are going to allow smartphones, they should be banned from the bedroom overnight, and they recommend setting time limits and parental controls. And for the growing number of parents who decide not to give their kids a smartphone at all, talk to your kids about your concerns and consider a stripped down phone for calls and texts only. Last year, Annalise Stacy got one of those. At 15 years old, she already sees the benefits of not having a smartphone. It's been a positive experience not growing up with one because I spent more time doing more valuable things and less time on my phone. I have better self-esteem and better social skills and I can definitely like communicate and just talk to people more. Kate Snow, NBC News, New York. In a recent study from the University of Texas, researchers gave people a series of tests without a smartphone near them and then with a smartphone near them just having that phone within reach, even though they weren't touching it, 
was enough of a distraction that the people didn't concentrate or do as well on their test. So food for thought there. All right, so in addition to a phone, there is a lot of other technology that parents may want to consider. Mark Spoonauer, who is a tech expert and global editor-in-chief of Tom's Guide, is here with a look at back-to-school tech for every age. Mark, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. All right, let's start with this. Parents who may not want to give kids a smartphone with all the bells and whistles yet, but they still want the safety and security of knowing they can get in touch with their kids. What are we looking at? So think of this as like a smartphone training wheels. Okay, right? I like so, it. So the first device is the Gyo Bit. Uh -huh. And the idea behind this device is being able to track your kids and know where they are. It's really light. It's 139, so fairly affordable. Okay. You can attach it to their backpack, their clothes. And the idea is that if your kid is coming home from school or, or leaving, you will get automatic notifications on your phone In based on location. Yes. Okay. Okay. And what about this guy right here, this little... Watch so this is kind of like the Dick Tracy watch <laughs> is, is making a comeback. So this is called the TikTok 4. Okay. It, it goes for $199. And unlike the Apple Watch, there's actually, not only can you make phone calls through it, but there's a 5 megapixel camera built in. So you can have video calls with grandma or whoever you like. Oh, you wow. get to set the contacts. Okay. The other good thing about this watch is that with kids, a lot of people with, with screen time increasing, people are worried about, are my kids staying active? There's an activity tracker built in, and oh. there's some gamification features, so your kids will want to be active. Moving on to the next item, laptops, yeah. very pricey. What do we need to know about you know the best ones to get for our kids? Sure. So we do a lot of testing um, at Tom's Guide, including battery life. And what we love about the new MacBook Air M2 in particular is that it lasts for 14 hours on a charge okay. where we just continuously surf the web. So it does really well in that regard. Mm -hmm. It's also very well built. And we think that students are going to like the new colors, including the blue model that you see here. Uh, the performance is great. And it has a high resolution full HD webcam built in because a lot of us are doing more video calls with parents at home, right. but even interacting with our professors. Okay. So let's yeah. move on quickly to the laptop sure. bag. Some of them actually have locks built in. Yeah. So this is uh, from Mancrow. It's only $26 on Amazon. Mm. And there's a couple of great features. One is that you can order one with a combination lock built in, which is really good mm -hmm. for protecting your laptop. The other thing that you see right here is that there's a, there's a USB cable. And if you want to, you can have it snaking outwards. And there's a USB port right here. So all you have to do is put in your own portable charger. So let's say you're at class and you're right. running low on juice. You can charge up your phone or your laptop using your backpack. Okay, I'm running out of time, but sure. let's talk about these trackers. Yeah. These are so important to keep track of all of your devices, right? Yeah. They're made by Apple, and who else? So this is Tile mm -hmm. and Apple, and the best way to look at these trackers and to think about them is that one is for Apple and iPhone, mm -hmm. and the other is for Android. Okay, right? very good. So <laughs> and then if you are a student riding a bike, got to get a helmet. Why is this one special? Uh, this is great because it has LEDs built in, and it gives you full visibility when you're on the road, and there's a remote control built in, so if you're riding your bike, uh -huh. you can actually let people know if you're about to turn left or right, and you can control that with a remote control on the handlebar or using your Apple Watch. Okay, I'm going to challenge you real quick. <laughs> 10 seconds. What's this? Okay, so the Nest Video Doorbell is one of our favorites because it gives you a very tall aspect ratio. So not only can you see people, but packages that are at your door, which okay. is really great for college students. Mark Spoonauer, our tech expert. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Still to come, how to talk to kids about peer pressure. But first, College Safety 101. How to avoid becoming a target for criminals. Consumer Confidential is coming right back. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now.
defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. College is a special time for so many young adults, but that independence also comes with new risks. So how do you avoid being a target for criminals? I went back to school for a refresher course on campus safety. At college campuses across America, it's back to school. Each year, around 20 million U.S. students attend college. For some, it's the first time they're on their own, and safety may not be their first priority. Fortunately, crime on college campuses has been on a steady decline for years. According to the most recent numbers in 2020, there were a reported 28,000 crimes. That's a record low, due in part to remote learning during the pandemic. But as we return to in-person classes, we're here on the campus of Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey for an important lesson on how to stay safe while in school. Joining me is Mike Sapraconi. He has 16 years of experience as an NYPD detective and is now the president of global security firm Squad Security. Mike, we talk about safety all the time. What do we need to know about staying safe when it comes to being on a college campus? Being alert, paying attention, always being vigilant to what's around you, making sure you know your friends, they know where you're going, they have your telephone number, you have theirs. Always to be in touch with somebody. And being prepared is so important. Always being prepared. Let me introduce you to Treasure Thomas. Hi, Treasure, come on in. She's a junior here at Fairly, and she's going to take you through a day in the life of a student here on campus. Great. Uh, nice to meet you, Treasure. Nice Looking to, forward to it. <laughs> nice to meet you, too. Her day starts when she drives to class. Great place to park. You want to park where there's a light. So at night, you, have, you know where your car is. You want to park otherwise places where there are other cars parked. And keep your key in your hand. Don't hit it 30 yards out because then someone's going to see that you're opening the doors. When you get close to your car, hit your fob, go in your door. And as soon as you get in the door, before you start your car, lock your door. Almost every school has campus-wide alerts, usually sent via text message. So what should I do if I get that alert? Well, if you're in a classroom, you should certainly be guided by your professor or your instructor. If not, you should definitely contact public safety or if you are your RA if you have some concerns. But you should have a point of contact that you should be able to go to. Another tip, add the number for campus public safety in your phone. They can usually respond faster than 911. A big mistake students make at the library. You see you have your computer out and you probably have your phone out on the desk and sometimes I'm sure you've gotten up to go do something you've left them there. Of course. And it's a bad idea. Theft is the number one crime on campuses, okay? It's a crime of opportunity. While walking around, Mike says to use the buddy system and if no one is available, call campus public safety. They usually will provide an escort. What if someone's making me uncomfortable and I'm nervous and I'm all by myself? That's important. A lot of people are afraid to say anything, but you should maybe change direction. Walk to where you might see more people and, and never be afraid to scream. Screaming is good. Screaming scares people. It alerts people. Emergency phone, uh, blue light box. So important on campuses to know where they are and to know how to use them. While touring the dorm, Mike immediately notices some security concerns, like this propped door, which Treasure says students do all the time. Anybody comes in this dorm, that stuff is theirs. I mean, it's just so easy to take. We got to make it a little harder on them. This is great to have the sunlight come in on a beautiful day. But this can't be left like this. You're on the first floor. Good job here by clocking the window. But you don't want everybody to have that easy access to see what's going on or what's in your room. Here's another thing. You have this mirror covering the peephole. It defeats the purpose of you being able to look out. At night, always use the buddy rule. Never accept drinks from strangers and wait until the next day to post on social media so no one can track your whereabouts. We covered a lot of stuff today. Good luck in school in this next semester and spread the word to all your friends. Thank you. Our thanks to Mike and Treasure for all those great tips. And Mike says the buddy system, it works best when you designate one person who will look for you if you don't come back to your dorm or you haven't checked in. All right, up next, dealing with tricky topics from drinking to consent. How to talk to kids about social pressure. You're watching Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? 
look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. NBC News, streaming free now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. It's a topic parents can't afford to ignore, the social pressure and dangers your kids might face. In 2019, nearly a quarter of 14 and 15 year olds reported having at least one alcoholic drink. And data from the CDC suggests one in 12 high school students experiences physical dating violence. Joining us with important insight is Dr. Danielle Dooley, a general pediatrician and former Georgetown University Health Services worker. Dr. Dooley, thank you for joining Consumer Confidential. Those numbers we just talked about, specifically with the violence, the dating violence, really alarming. What should young people keep in mind when they're going out on a date? So I think it's really important that we equip our teenagers and young adults with the facts and the knowledge. First of all, they should know that about eight out of 10 instances of sexual assault occur between people who know each other. So I think that's really important for them to know. We also want them to know about the different types of violence. There's physical violence, emotional violence, and uh, sexual violence. And then lastly, we really want to start talking with our teens and young adults about what are the components of a healthy relationship. Are these relationships based on trust and honesty and independence and anger control and respect? Or are they relationships based on disrespect, dishonesty, a lack of anger control and a lack of trust? Dr. Dooley, how should parents navigate difficult conversations on these topics like substance abuse or consent? So first of all, just like you might have a packing list for your child's dorm or what they're going to need for their academic course loads each year, also on your list should be having this conversation with your child. And I want parents to know that they're not alone. There are a number of resources out there to help guide parents. First and most importantly is committing to having the conversation. Secondly, mm -hmm. finding a quiet space and time in which to do it so you can really have a conversation with your child. Third, you might want to use something that's been in social media or current events as a way to open up the discussion and find out what your teenager knows. Where are they in their thinking and their knowledge about these topics? What are they seeing amongst their friends? And then finally, commit to being non-judgmental and really hearing your teen and hearing what they've been seeing and experiencing are some great ways to open this conversation and navigate these difficult topics. And these aren't just one and done conversations, right? Dr. Dooley, should you revisit this over time? Absolutely. It is so important that these conversations happen repeatedly and that maybe when you have that first conversation, you really set the stage to I hope this is the first of many conversations. You can mm -hmm. always come and speak to me about things you may have questions about or are concerned about. And even if I don't know the answer, I will try to find the correct information or answer for you. So repeated check-ins and conversations are critical. Thank you. I love that actual language that you're equipping parents with. What are some basic do's and don'ts when you are talking to your kids about these social dangers? So I think some important do's are making sure you make the time and the space for the conversation, asking open-ended questions. So really trying to let your child or young adult tell you what they think or what they know or what they've seen rather than asking questions that are just going to lead to yes or no answers. Mm -hmm. I also think that parents shouldn't be afraid to communicate their own values and expectations around substance abuse and sexual activity. And I think some don'ts are don't skip the conversation. It's a really critical conversation to have. 
children are seeing a lot about relationships through social media, and I think it's really important that they see and learn and hear about relationships from their own parents as well. So don't skip the conversation and try not to get emotional. You may hear things that are hard to hear, but you really want mm -hmm. to create that open atmosphere for your teenager. Hold the judgment, as you said earlier. Dr. Dooley, what about, what about some red flags that your child might be in trouble? So red flags that your child might be having issues would be if you noticed a sudden withdrawal from activities or sports or organizations or things that they used to enjoy doing. If you noticed a decline in their studies or academics, if you notice they're just not participating in things like they used to, they may have mood changes and seem angry hostile, depressed, or anxious. So all of those would be red flags that it's important to check in with your child. And you could also offer them the option that if they don't feel comfortable or ready to talk to you, is there someone at their school or their college that they would feel comfortable talking to at this point? Dr. Danielle Dooley, thank you so much. We so appreciate your time. And that is our time for now for all of us at NBC News. I'm Vicki Wint. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential right here on Today All Day. But is this then, crazy? Yeah. This yeah. is like, it's like a, the best floral arrangement I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. I love mushrooms. I mean, I really, really love mushrooms. They are an essential part of a plant-based lifestyle because they're such an easy swap for me. But I've got lots of questions about fungi. How do they grow? Where do they grow? And which types have the most unique texture? I'm gonna learn all about their culinary range with chef and mushroom enthusiast, my friend, Sophia Rowe. Then I'll travel to Colorado to see how mushroom roots are being transformed into a hearty new protein. But first, I wanna learn some basics. So I'm heading out to Smallholds, an innovative farm in Brooklyn, New York. Let's go. When you think about mushrooms, you probably think of those capped little fungi. But there are literally thousands of edible mushrooms out there. And no, I'm not talking about that kind of mushroom. A lot of people think that they don't like mushrooms because they're used to eating the same mushroom. And they think all mushrooms are the same, but they're not. It's like saying you don't like mushrooms is like saying you don't like plants. Um, like, a, like the differences between a trumpet and an oyster and a button mushroom, it's like saying like an almond tree versus a head of lettuce. Um, and an apple, you know, they're very different. <laughs> Andrew Carter and Adam DiMartino founded Smallhold, an organic mushroom farm in 2017. They share a passion for rare mushroom varieties and want to bring those tastes and textures to more people. There's a whole kingdom out there and everyone's used to eating the same mushroom. A white and a brown mushroom and a portobello mushroom, they're all the same mushroom. That's right, white button, crumini, and portobello are all the same type of mushroom. Their scientific name is agaricus, if you want to be fancy about it. The industry grows those because that's what they're used to growing. Consumers are used to consuming those. You can look at other regions, like if you go to China or Japan or Korea, the mushroom industry is way more advanced than it is here. So like consumers in certain regions are eating 10 to 20 times as much mushrooms as people are in the United States. So what were your first steps to starting Smallhold? The early beginning was uh, building out a lab in a basement at a house, and it looked crazy. Andrew and Adam started experimenting with trumpet mushrooms. After perfecting the process, they expanded to shiitake and oyster. In just five years, that basement startup moved into a shipping container, then to their first farm in Brooklyn. The company has grown rapidly with funds from dozens of investors and a soaring demand for mushrooms. Over the last few years is that people really started getting interested in food as medicine, trying to eat less meat, trying to be sustainable, trying to eat local. 
all of these things ended up just kind of centering around mushrooms. In 2020, organic mushroom sales grew by 20%. Feeding that demand, Smallhold now grows 15 different types of mushrooms, producing a whopping 1.5 million pounds each year for hundreds of grocery stores and restaurants. Mushrooms are grown by a process called inoculation. A spore is placed deep inside a substrate, like a log. The spores germinate, then feed on the wood, growing into mycelium, or mushroom roots. This fruiting body is probably like four, four days, four or five days old. It takes about four weeks for the roots to be fully grown. That's when cute baby mushrooms, called pins, start to appear on the surface. In about a week, they're ready to harvest. Fungi are its own kingdom. They're functionally more similar to animals than they are like plants. They breathe in oxygen, they release CO2, they digest stuff, they don't go through photosynthesis, and so their interaction with the environment is just so different than plants. Traditional mushroom farms cultivate their fungi in mulch with a mix of hay, straw, and corn cob. But Smallhold is focused on growing in urban areas to make the entire operation more sustainable. City farms might seem strange, but fungi don't require a lot of light, water, or space to thrive. Our mushrooms, we grow, they're called saprotrophic mushrooms, and so they're wood-loving mushrooms. They digest wood. All of the substrates that we're using, that's the stuff that's inside of this block, about 90% of it is sawdust. Smallhold's mushrooms are grown in bags filled with a compound from mills and factories, so they're reusing a byproduct from the timber industry. And those futuristic containers don't just look cool. And so these chambers themselves have really intricate controls over all the climate that they're exposed to. That allows them to forego pesticides. Plus, the fragile mushrooms aren't susceptible to extreme weather. Can you walk me through the environmental impact of growing mushrooms? It's one of the most sustainable products you can probably find in the grocery store. We did a big life cycle analysis, which is a large like, third-party analysis to understand exactly what's going on with your company. Our carbon impact was about 30% less than any other mushroom farm we could find. Over 60% of the country's mushrooms are grown in one Pennsylvania county, which means it takes a lot of fuel to ship them across the country. So a lot of mushrooms are actually imported from overseas, and so the carbon footprint of those is really crazy. Smallholds mushrooms are grown in Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and Austin, Texas. They also operate over a dozen mini farms, custom-built tanks that can grow mushrooms inside restaurants and grocery stores. With farms in strategically placed cities, Smallhold plans to reduce carbon emissions by continuing to ship locally. When you're buying a product from Smallhold, like a fresh mushroom in a grocery store, it was grown close to there. And so we have a national brand, like you can be from New York and go to LA and recognize Smallhold on the shelf, but those mushrooms were grown in LA. Most mushrooms also have a naturally meaty texture, which makes them a great vegetarian swap. The more people eat these products, generally speaking, they're eating less meat, whether they realize it or not. And so every time we get someone to eat a little less beef or a little less chicken, then we think that we have a larger impact on the planet because it's less carbon intensive, less water intensive. Okay, Andrew, we're gonna harvest these mushrooms, which I'm very excited about. Yeah, we have uh, blue oysters, we have lion's mane, yellow oysters, and trumpet mushrooms. Um, we can start with the blue oyster. Let's do this it. This one's pretty fun because, you know, you can't make any promises, but a lot of the time, you kind of get the whole thing just in one pick. Whoa! Like that. Here you go. Ah. And so, big, <laughs> big blue oyster Wait, mushroom. this is so dense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You uh, take a big cluster of mushrooms uh -huh. and you shove like garlic in here, like whatever herbs you want, so thyme and rosemary, but you just kind of like shove it inside the cluster itself. You roast the whole thing? And you just roast the whole thing. So let's try the lion's mane. So I would just pick off Pick off one of those. Yeah, there you go. Lion's mane is so beautiful and so unique. And this to me is like the most otherworldly mushroom because it just looks like no other. And when you uh, you can take it apart, it like kind of peels sort of like mozzarella. It's so or, like, crazy. A lot of people use it as like a shellfish replacement. Um, Cause you can pull it like so yeah, it's almost you can stringy. Pull it. Next, we harvested yellow oyster mushrooms, which were more delicate than their blue cousins. They'd be perfect in a creamy soup. But even Andrew has a favorite fungi. I love trumpets so much, and so if you cut it, uh, this isn't the best knife skills, but 
you can cut them like this and then you can have a nice scallop. Yeah. Now, these are probably the most popular for people who are trying to like imitate meat with a whole mushroom. And so the other mushrooms can give you the texture and the flavor and nutrition and all that kind of stuff, but these can like really stand in as a fake scallop or a fake bacon. Why do you want people to eat more mushrooms? I mean, they're, they're great for you. There's a lot of nutrition. They're high in fiber. They have amazing antioxidants. They have vitamin D. And what I really like about them is that they have that umami and that experience that replaces meat. I already eat a lot of mushrooms, but I'm convinced now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Smallhold got me excited to try something with my new favorite fungi. So I invited mushroom enthusiast, James Beard award-winning chef, my friend Sophia Rowe to my kitchen. Hi! My friend, Sophia, I told you this before, that we are talking about mushrooms, and I was like, listen, I can't do this without Sophia. Talk to me about the role that mushrooms play in your work and in your world. I went to culinary school, and I was sort of kind of playing in that plant-based world, and I felt like fungi and mushrooms were a really great way to encourage a lot of depth, which I feel like in plant-based cooking, sometimes you kind of lose, you know? you Like meat and dairy, those things create a lot of depth. It's pretty remarkable the types of flavors that you can create. And this is not a new idea. They're, particularly in Asian cultures, they've been using different kinds of fungus for forever um, in their cooking. But for me, that was really when I was like, okay, this is sexy. Can you just talk to me about how you work with them? It's almost about like, what am I trying to create? You know, if someone's a very big meat person and they want to go plant-based for a minute or for a meal, I think it's really important to cook things in the same way that you cook meat, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I don't even know that that's just mushrooms or just fungi, right? A lot of times with steaks, you're braising, you're roasting, you're searing. There's no reason you can't treat plants the same way. I'm, I'm just super excited to know what we're cooking today. Yes. Tell me about the dish and yes. uh, put me to work. All right, so what we have here is lion's mane. When I'm looking for uh, a lion's mane, you want them to be kind of fluffy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been touching this one a lot. You don't want them to be slimy. You don't want them to stink. If they stink or they're slimy, they're no good. And that's kind of the rule, the general rule with any mushroom. Yeah. In terms of washing them, these are commercially cultivated. Mm -hmm. So they are not wild, these are not feral. So these are not gonna need to be like really, really washed. You just wanna, you wanna wipe them down, they're good. Do not get your mushrooms wet. They don't <laughs> like it. So this is a good one. This is a great shape. So what okay. we're gonna do is we're basically gonna make like a lion's mushroom steak. And you'll see that I've kind of like, as I'm even talking, I'm kind of pressing this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like where, just for a second, we're kind of like trying to create like a little steak here, mm. like a little hanger steak. Why okay? are you using lion's mane here, Sophia? I think lion's mane is really delicious, mm. but it's great structure. So it's really great in terms of like replacing meat. If you can't find this, you can cook an oyster mushroom or even a big portobello in exactly the same method. Mm. So the, the key here is you're leaving it nice and whole. Okay. I kind of want to press these down. 
So I'm just gonna score this one side, okay? And uh, why are you scoring it? So we want the flavor to get in, mm. doggy. We want it to be inside. <laughs> right, so we're gonna make this glaze. All right, let's so do it. Because we're attempting to make a steak, okay? <laughs> what we wanna do is we wanna help, we wanna help these lines made mushrooms along. Three tablespoons of vegan butter. If you want to use regular butter, th that's, that's your you house do that. and do whatever you want. All right, we like, we like it softened like this because we're gonna be whisking it up. We want this to be like glazed texture. Okay. Okay. We also have coconut aminos. It's just like a soy free soy sauce vibe. <laughs> okay, I also like it because it's a little sweet. Yes, it um, is. And for a glaze, that's really nice. So the sweetness is important because the sweetness is gonna give us caramelization. So grab the sesame. Yes. Get it. Sesame oil. Love it. We love it. You could use toasted if you wanted, but this is just regular old sesame oil. Next up, ingredients to really up the umami factor. Miso, Dijon mustard, and tomato paste. We're gonna just get some, get a good like pinch of salt in there. And then you're just gonna whiskey do, dude. So this is gonna get, I think we have this on medium heat. Okay. Okay. We have some grapeseed oil here. The reason we're using grapeseed is high smoking point. We're using cast iron. You don't have to use cast iron. You can use whatever you have. Um, so we're going um, score side down. down. So what's gonna happen? We're yeah. gonna put them on. We're gonna get a good sear on each side. And then we're gonna brush our glaze on. Okay. Okay. Two minutes, flip it, two minutes. Then we're gonna take them off and we're gonna let them rest. Just like you would have Just steak. like meat. Just like meat. Crazy. We're gonna treat these just like meat. I love that. This is why we want this hot. Love it. Just drop it down. <laughs> what we can do here, this is like a little like a little tip too. You can mm. always just like just like, flatten it down. Yeah, same, same, like same you would you would do. I'm sorry, do you have a SoundCloud? <laughs> <laughs> I do now. So just 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 to kind of encourage again, you want to yep. encourage that flattening, right? Yep. Get it nice and thin, I and that way that. The, 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 the marinade is not having to penetrate so deep. You know how to make a steak, you know how to do these mushrooms. After three minutes, time for a flip. Look Wait. It, look it. Oh. Gorgina. So we're just gonna brush this on, <laughs> almost like you're basting a steak or something. Oh. Come on, baby. Everything about this feels like you are Van Gogh and I am your apprentice. Oh my God. You, but except you could do this, but you see I the could. sizzle and the, you know? So what's gonna happen is these are gonna be sitting here, they're gonna be caramelizing, they're gonna be getting juicy. We're gonna take the rest of this glaze and we're gonna baste them a little bit. Ooh. So this is, this. the basting method is never gonna be bad. It's always gonna be good. I mean, look how gorgeous that looks. It's beautiful. It's, I mean, stunning. A few more minutes in the pan. Literally crazy. Uh, crazy, right? It kind of looks like me too. Uh-huh. These are gonna rest, okay? Okay. It's five minutes, he doesn't need to okay. not no, trying to crazy. Like, nothing wild. As the mushrooms rested, Sophia chopped up some green onions for later. Then it was time to cut into the lion's main steaks. It's meaty. Can we show them? <laughs> like they need to know. That looks Everyone really alert. meaty. <laughs> alert. <laughs> but even like it almost it's almost like like you wouldn't really know. It kind of it just looks like mm -hmm. chicken. Sophia recommends serving the steaks over rice with a few garnishes. First some sesame seeds, then chili crisp, then scallions. Just like me, Sophia loves a little spice. Come on. It's mm. so good. Wait, this is mm. this is literally the best mushroom dish I've literally ever had. Mm, it's so good. I love it. It is an unfamiliar ingredient mm. cooked in a familiar format. Correct. So I think if you're a beginner to mushrooms, a mm. really great thing to do is whatever you can find locally, just try cooking those mushrooms, whatever they are, in mm. this format. Mm. Try cooking them this way. Yeah and you're gonna get a completely new relationship to mushrooms. Also, for the people who are like, I hate mushrooms, just give the method a try, mm -hmm. right? I feel like we have to take a photo. Let's do it. Cause like, when have we ever done a little friend cooking sesh? Let's do it. We need to do it. We need a whole photo shoot. We need a, we need a, we need a whole photo shoot. <laughs> I love you, wait, give me a hug. Thank you for coming. Of course. <laughs> Sophia's lion's main steak looked a lot like chicken, but one company in Colorado is completely transforming mushroom roots into an actual meat substitute. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. 
This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. Wake up each other now. Doesn't oh, it just up. feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready. SG, you ready? We're fresh and reorganized for fall. Start today. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just feel good to be back to school? It does. Start today. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Meat substitutes are everywhere these days, and they're made with a wide variety of ingredients, from whole veggies to soy protein and different oils. Enter Meaty. Here in Boulder, Colorado, mushrooms are the main attraction, and I got an exclusive first look inside their new factory. Meaty isn't trying to replicate ground beef. They're mimicking whole cuts of meat, like steak or chicken breast. It's like a super meat. Yeah, it's a where, super meat. <laughs> where it has all the protein you would yeah. want from meat. Then all the fiber and vitamins and minerals you find in plants. Yeah. CEO Tyler Huggins founded Meaty in 2016 after earning his PhD in environmental engineering. Tell me your journey to Meaty and why you started this company. Well, let's we'll start off with, with meat. We, uh, we have a growing population, have a high demand for protein. Meat is, is a growing demand. Given my history uh, studying nature, I knew there was this really cool, magical, root-like structure in the soil. Biologists call it mycelium. We call it mushroom root. Tyler and his team developed a patent-pending process that turned the fuzzy, hair-like mycelium strands into a product that mimics the taste and texture of meat. Unlike mushrooms, you won't find the raw roots in any grocery store. Currently, Meaty sells a steak-like filet and a faux chicken cutlet that's available plain or with a crispy breading. And this is the place where it all comes together. This is it. This is where the magic happens right here. This is the future of food. The mushroom roots are grown inside these giant tanks. This is this where Meaty is grown, We right? essentially take one spore. Yep. It's like the fungi equivalent of a seed. Okay. We start growing up the mushroom root, and then we throw it into this, into this tank. The tank is filled with water that's packed with nutrients mushroom roots need to thrive. And how long does it take to cultivate and grow and harvest meat? Extremely fast. In this facility, we're able to create the meat equivalent of a whole cow in just four days. So tell me how you replicate the texture of traditional meat. It all starts from the magic of this mushroom root. We grow it in-house in a clean uh, environment, so no exposure to heavy metals or pesticides wow. or herbicides or anything like that. At that state, it kind of looks like uh, applesauce. This is meaty in the raw form before it's processed. And when you form it into a, uh, a chicken breast-like shape or a steak, mm -hmm. those strands become the texture that is very similar. Again, eats just like traditional meat. You can eat it just like that. That's just all natural mushroom root. I'm gonna you eat it. <laughs> okay. It's a blank it's, canvas. It really tastes like, I don't wanna say nothing because yeah. there is like a little bit of something, but it is so, like you could throw flavor and spice on that. Including mushroom root, Meaty's Chicken Swap has just four ingredients, salt, natural flavoring, and acacia gum, a fiber used as a food stabilizer. But I had to know, is it healthy? So one of our, our four ounce uh, steak has about 18 grams of protein. 
and then it has all the fiber and other vitamins and minerals you only find in plants. No cholesterol, no saturated fat, there's no sugar in it. Meaty is now available online, but it often sells out fast, really fast. The company is opening a second farm to meet demand, and Meaty will soon be available on supermarket shelves. What is the future of Meaty? We see there's a lot of interest in alternatives to traditional meat. But what we're doing differently is whole food protein, simple ingredient lists, super nutritious, and whole cuts. I think that opens up an entirely new demographic and group of folks who, who are excited to embrace something like this. After hearing so much about these mushroom roots, I wanted to see how it really tasted. NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, is this? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just again. feel good to be back to it school? Does. Start today. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, is this? In Boulder, Colorado, the folks behind Meaty are turning mushroom roots into a new meat substitute. At the factory's test kitchen, they're experimenting with the best ways to cook it. I met with Debbie Downing, the company's head research chef, to learn more. I'm so excited to try this. Will you show me how to cook it up? It's the mushroom root, right? Right, right. When you think about cooking mushrooms, it likes to soak up that oil, soak up the sauce. Super porous, yeah. Soak up anything that you give it. So best practices for our product is that we actually want to add oil to it first. Right. We want to just give a little bit of a drizzle here. Season with salt and pepper, a little oil in the pan, then time for the cutlet. All right, it's ready. Oh yeah. Sizzles really nicely. The chicken and steak both take about eight minutes to cook. Just like meat, the goal is to develop a nice sear for more flavor. I think it's ready All right, to flip. ready? Yeah. Woo! I just gasped. I haven't eaten chicken in a while. Yeah. I used to, so I know what chicken tastes like. Yeah. But I haven't cooked it in forever. And first of all, this is like very similar in cook. Like when you look at the browning yeah. and the caramelization around the edges. Like, did you want to cut it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like kind of freaking out right now. Get into it. I know, I know. Sorry, Tyler. I'm just like, just I'm processing. I can't get over how much it smells like chicken. And even looking at the texture, I'm going to pick it up and just show you. Oh my god, I just touched it for the first time, too. It's like the, the texture of it, of animal protein that you would normally see. I feel like it has that. But how? It's the mushroom root, right? The fibers. That's the mycelium. Yeah, gives you that texture and that look. This is not chicken, but it really looks like it. OK, I'm going to taste it. Should I taste it? This will be your first time, like yes. stressed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> is there a mic I can draw? This is like taking me back to when I used to eat chicken. Literally. And I'm not just saying this as I'm on camera. Next up, the steak filet. All right, steak. I'm trying it. Do you need another mic to drop? I need another again. mic to drop. This is insane. Yeah. This tastes like red meat. I haven't had chicken nuggets in years, so I was really excited to try the crispy chicken. This kind of takes me back to 
days of like growing up and eating fried chicken. chicken this is, am I getting punked? <laughs> <laughs> Got you. But I wasn't done eating yet. The meaty team had a big surprise for me. Shut up! I'm leaving. <laughs> I've seen my book. Yep. This is from my book. I didn't know I was going to eat chicken and cry today. My masala mac and cheese and cabbage salad from my cookbook both got the meaty treatment with their chicken. I was so excited. Also on the menu, breakfast tacos and steak in a chimichurri sauce. I even got to try some products in development, a turkey deli meat and beef jerky. They were delicious. This is not gonna be cute, I'm just warning everyone now. <laughs> that is a pretty big sandwich. Mm. I'm taking this home. This... Wow. You guys are all like crazy magicians. Like something weird is going on here. <laughs> Whoa. That's breakfast. Yeah. In true meat fashion, we need to take a selfie. So yes. if you don't mind, yeah. we're gonna get in here. All right, say meaty. Meaty. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Yeah. This was so yeah. special. No, really. thank you. I don't know if I can go on. My love for mushrooms has been cemented. From a delicious side dish to a show-stopping main, their culinary versatility is unparalleled. And that's what makes mushrooms truly magic. Good morning, it's Wednesday and it's gonna be another hot one. Yeah, the mm -hmm. nation's power grid pushed to the limit overnight. Is 